Whoa, my mic's on. Put them in alphabetical order. We put, we put Mark at the end? Right. There we are. All right, good morning, everyone. We'll start with roll call. Uh, Trustee Daly. Here. Trustee Maestas. Not here. Drum roll for Trustee Marks. Present. Trustee Mejia. Present. Vice President Irvin. Is uh, going to be joining us shortly. Trustee Lopez. Here. And President Brown is also here. Okay. The meeting is now called to order. Welcome to Modesto City Schools uh, special board meeting of April 1st, 2023. Um, any public comments received via email or voicemail following the posting of the board agenda and prior to the board meeting will not be read aloud but have been transcribed and printed with copies provided to each board member. Were there any? I don't believe there were. Okay. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. This open session meeting of the Board of Trustees is being live streamed at the direction of the board. The live stream is available on the district's website, and the recordings will be available for viewing the first business day after the board meeting. Uh, MCS has provided an opportunity for the public to provide comments. It's outlined on the agenda. The public has been given an opportunity to call in and leave a voicemail, send us a comment via email, or appear in person before the board. Any public comments received via email or voicemail following the posting of the board agenda and prior to noon, the day of a board meeting, will not be read aloud, but have been transcribed and printed with copies provided to each board member prior to the start of the meeting and are available to the public. Voice and email public comments will be attached to future board meeting minutes for approval. Uh, this practice will continue until further notice. For members of the public who are interested in commenting in the future, we welcome your comments. I do not see any members of the public here, but if someone should uh, come for any portion of this meeting, uh, we will uh, be able to address public comments throughout the meeting. So uh, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Ready? Begin. Republic for which it stands. <clears throat> okay, uh, do I hear a motion to approve the order of discussion action items? Motion by Trustee Marks and uh, second by Trustee Mejia. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> okay, this would normally be period for public presentation, but we have no members of the public here, unless any of our cabinet members wish to address something that's uh, not on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Right, I think we're ready to roll. Perfect. So just before we get started with this marathon board uh, policy Saturday, um, I first want to thank everyone for giving up a Saturday um, to do this work. Um, as you know, the state of California spends a large part of their time, the state legislature, 
changing laws, adding laws, uh, modifying laws, and that really what brings us to today. Um, the majority of the policies that are before you <coughs> are required by law. And rather than interlacing them throughout our board meetings, um, I really feel the board meetings are a time for um, presentations on initiatives and projects. Board policies are certainly important. Um, it, this also helps on putting it all in one day so we can really take a look at what policies are coming through to the board. Um, just to try to frame um, the work and just as a friendly reminder, because I know you guys do have a lot in front of you, a board policy is the what. You direct the what. You guide the superintendent, so the superintendent then guides the staff on the what. And we vote on the what. The administrative regulations is the how. You've given authorization to myself and myself to give to staff on um, the how. And so we don't vote on the hows. We don't vote on the administrative regulations, but we certainly have conversations around it. So um, I just want to remind us <clears throat> of um, the, the format of that. Additionally, um, Mike Rich is going to be here. He is out at math, the math competition. Math Super Bowl, um, and so he's opening up the Math Super Bowl at, at one of our high schools for the county, um, and he will come back in. I think he's going to come and go twice because he's he's a dual role today. Um, so if you see him, um, that is the case. And lastly, I do want to thank um, Cabinet for this Saturday. I'm not sure we were um, working well with the schedules and also um, staff. We've had a tough week. We've been out um, each night, with the exception of last night, um, until 9 o'clock or later. And so I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your Saturday. And hopefully you have a restful Sunday. Um, and we will um, see each other again 830 on Monday. So thank you for that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to President Brown. So I also want to thank everyone. Uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks. And we, uh, we want you to know how much we as a board appreciate all the extra effort and time that's gone into not only preparing for today, but handling all those late night meetings that uh, have been held on our campuses with the public, dealing with uh, some very difficult topics. And I know that's been stressful, so thank you. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that when we get together for these policy discussions, it's really gratifying to know that we have a diversified board and that we have people with specialties and interests that uh, are able to focus on the very specific things that we need to address. So thank you in advance for your time and effort and the uh, time that you've spent on reviewing these policies and being prepared to uh, ask the tough questions. So with that, I'm going to use this uh, blue policy guide to try to run the agenda this morning and we'll try to be as efficient as possible but we won't slow things down or we won't speed things up and gloss over things that are important that we need to discuss so we'll take the time necessary and we'll try not to belabor any uh, points and wordsmith things to death but uh, let's roll so very first uh, looks like uh, Mr. Hurst, you're up with uh, a few items, and we'll start with uh, board policy. Um, I'm not sure what the letter E stands for. Exhibit. Oh, okay, exhibit. 4, 0420.41, Charter School Oversight. Don't need to repeat it. I think you guys can hear a small group. So, uh, yes, we are here this morning for Board Policy 4220.41 and the accompanying exhibit that goes with it. This is in regard to charter school oversight. Uh, the changes that are being proposed are due to the legislature having updated uh, oversight provisions related to charter schools and making sure that we have incorporated all of those into our uh, current board policy. I think the majority of the changes really are additions that are required by the law rather than just simple revisions. At this point, I'll uh, open it up for any questions you might have. Any questions from board members? We do have a charter school expert among us. Uh, Trustee Mejia, any questions on this one? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so do we need to acknowledge 
Okay. So, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of this uh, board policy? I motion. Motion by Trustee Daly. Uh, second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. That uh, passes okay. unanimously. So we'll move on to number two. Board policy 1223, Compensatory Education District Parent Advisory Committee. And this is a deletion. Correct. So in regard to board policy 1223, as you can see, this was adopted back in 1986, almost 40 years ago. <laughs> this is uh, proposed to be deleted as it is an outdated board policy. It is no longer in gambit, nor does it ap apply to any applicable uh, laws we have today. It has been replaced as far as the committee by the LCAP Advisory Committee, which is uh, um, regulated under the LCAP uh, regulations. So with that, uh, any questions you may have. Any questions? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the deletion of Board Policy 1223? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Did I see your hand? Yes. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Thank you. I will move to Board Policy 4113 and Policy 4 dash, oh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Board policy 4113.4, 4213.4, and 4313.4, temporary modified light duty. This is Mr. Prochane. Good morning, trustees of the board, Dr. Noguchi and members of cabinet. I am Stephen Beauchene, the director one of legal compliance and investigations with the Human Resources Office. I have the pleasure of presenting three different board policies and or administrative, administrative regulations for you this morning. And the first is board policy 4113.4 at SEC. This board policy establishes a district-wide policy of working with employees to provide temporary modified light duty assignments upon request if those employees have a medical condition that otherwise inhibits their ability to perform their essential job functions. Uh, this policy is being presented um, not as a mandate necessarily, but it is um, being recommended for approval by the board this morning. If there are any questions regarding this policy, I'd be happy to address those at this time. I do have one question. Sure. So we're looking at three different policies, but all with the same language, is that correct? No, I just meant that I'll be here for the three items on the list, this being the first of those three. Okay, so this is has three different numbers. That is correct, but this is one policy, and I'm not sure why it, the, the numbering structure is formatted like that. It might be to allow for the differentiation between classified and certificated groups, usually. Um, but as it stands, although the, the, the numbering system here has three different numbers, it is one board policy, one item. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. So any questions other than mine? Uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of this policy? Motion. motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Then we'll move on to uh, the... AR 4157.2, 4257.2, and 4357.2, ergonomics. And this is a new policy, or a new AR. Oh, it's board policy and AR. I'm sorry. Did I, did I universal precautions right now. Okay, where am I? Number four. Number four, sorry. Don't worry. So this is board policy and uh, AR 4119.43, 42.19.43, and 43.19.43, universal precautions. This board policy establishes the requirement that the district establish and implement universal precautions to both provide information and establish protocols 
for the handling of substances and or materials which may carry the possibility of spreading bloodborne pathogens and other infectious diseases. The administrative regulation in turn establishes the specific requirements and procedures to be utilized by employees to prevent the infection and or spread of these um, pathogens and or diseases. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Do we have any questions from the board? Do we have a motion? I motion. Motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. And now we'll move on to <clears throat> uh, item number five, which is the administrative regulation 4157.2 and 4257.2 and 4357.2 ergonomics, also a new policy. This administrative regulation establishes the requirement that the district implement an ergonomics program to identify risk factors in the work environment that may result in injuries or illnesses to employees in the workplace. The regulation also establishes the criteria to be followed uh, in this program if two or more repetitive motion injuries are identified to have occurred with two or more employees engaging in identical work activities. This is being presented based on the um, requirements established in the Code of Regulations for this kind of program. So if there are any questions or comments about this regulation, I'd be happy to address those. Do we have any questions? Saying none, do we have a motion to? Oh, it's an AR. We do not need a motion on this one. Thank you. Um, then we are going to move on to uh, Ms. Barkas. Good morning, President Brown, Board of Trustees, Dr. Noguchi, and Cabinet. Um, I am here. This is first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're here. <laughs> and Thank you. To get going. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Board policy and AR 6158 uh, independent study. Ms. Barkas. Okay, um, so this uh, particular first reading of the proposed revision aligns with the new law um, that has come forth, AB 181, which encourages all districts to offer different forms of independent study, which we already do. Um, we're just updating uh, this, we're recommending, recommend, recommending, oh my goodness, uh, recommending um, to add the language uh, that supports the AB 181. One of the significant changes is that we have our short-term independent study start at three days instead of five days. Um, but other than that, uh, our independent study process would stay the same. Any questions? So um, I'm actually uh, Trustee Maestas. So he has seven or eight different comments through. He, we, we met uh, a couple days ago, so he does have a question on this one. It really isn't a question. It's more of a clarification, and I'll, I'll just put it out there, and you can pretend I'm him. Um, on page E, so um, uh, 6158E, his notes here said um, it just appeared as though there were grammar errors. It didn't make sense in that second paragraph that's all read. Um, and so he just put it out there. I don't have any suggested changes, and I was just curious if you also read that and it was difficult to understand. That was if, it? That's all? If That's we could just have a set of eyes uh, from the district to uh, check for grammar, that would be great. And we did do that. I gave it to Mr. Godot yesterday. I gave him this sheet and said, I'm going to be saying that we, we believe that there may be some grammar issues there, and he came back and said he didn't see any. I just wanted to reflect um, uh, Trustee Maestas' comment because I didn't read it at the time, uh, 7.30 in the morning the other day. Um, so I just bring that forward. So if all of you didn't um, have additional concerns with, the, uh, the, the, with grammar, then we can just move forward, and I've reflected his thought. I just have a point of clarification about our independent study. Uh, if we have a short-term independent study, does that move, does the oversight stay with the uh, classroom teacher, or does that move to the independent study to, 
uh, department. So short-term independent study is site-based, so it does still fall under the teachers. So um, we have independent study teachers identified at each of the schools that will work with the classroom teachers to provide the work for the students. And at what point does it move from short-term into a long-term and shift to off-site to the uh, independent study program? Uh, so after 15 days, uh, 15 consecutive days, then we will look at putting the student on um, long-term independent study, which is our MVA program, Modesto Virtual Academy. Okay, thank you. I know that that's not part of the policy, but sometimes sure. we use this uh, period to learn about what's happening in the district. So appreciate uh, you addressing those questions. Yes, no problem. All right, any okay, so other questions? Not a question, but <clears throat> I think I see what Trustee Maestas was talking about, and it's just this, the last sentence <clears throat> in that uh, paragraph. So it did, I think just the commas are in the wrong place. <laughs> That's how I feel when I read it. So if we could just move the commas. I think it says, in such cases, evidence, and there's a comma there, so it should say, in such cases, comma, evidence, no comma, evidence from appropriate licensed, appropriately licensed professionals of the students who need to participate in independent study, and I don't think there's a need for another comma there, shall be submitted to the superintendent-designee. So I think it's just moving one comma and deleting two commas. So I think I can see where he says it doesn't flow correct with the way the commas are. So I see that we're adding a comma after cases and then taking the other two subsequent commas out, which, yes. which makes sense. That's it an easy like fix. It, yeah, it seems like that's all that's needed in that because it is, if you pause it at all those spots, it doesn't make sense. So I can right. see where he was. Well, thank you for finding that for us, Trustee Marks. And with any other questions? With those changes, uh, do we have a motion for to accept the first reading of this board policy? I'll second. Trustee Mejia made the motion, seconded by Trustee Marks. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let's wait. <laughs> So, we'll go again. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Passes unanimously. And uh, Superintendent uh, Noguchi, are you voting for Maestas when he's made corrections or no? I okay. Can't. <laughs> you can't, no. but I'm just uh, playing a bit. All right. Uh, so, that's independent study. We're moving on now to number seven. Uh, this is board policy and AR 6178, career technical education. Okay, and here, uh, once again, um, there are some new laws surrounding uh, career technical education. Um, one is that uh, it's no longer, we no longer authorize a course in CTE as an alternative to visual and performing arts or world language requirements. Uh, so that, that particular law has sunsetted and this is the new law. Um, and in addition, um, there's some new labor laws that require us to notify all apprenticeship programs within our region if we are holding a career fair. So those are the two significant. Um, the law is AB 643. So how do, you, how do you know what those programs are to be able to notify them? And that is a, uh, an excellent question that um, the other CTE directors and I have been discussing, what that looks like, if it's going to be that we notify the county and the county has a representative, um, or that we just notify everybody that we're aware of, and that's on um, the state, there's a, on the CDE website, there is a list of apprenticeships, and so we can send out a mass email to them. So um, we are all in that discussion as to what that actually looks like, what the strategy, strategy is around that. Mm -hmm. Great, and that uh, good part of that is that our students will be aware if anyone else is offering those kind of fairs also. Yes. Great. Right. Okay, any other questions regarding continuing education and this policy? Trustee Marks. I just have a comment. Uh, I really appreciate this, and the link learning portion, I wish we had that because I served on the link learning board, and I was so excited about what the possibilities were for students to be able to get that experience through the businesses in the community and then go on to college or go on to a, a technical school so they could get the, the skills they needed. But anyway, I know we're working on all of that and we have such great pathways right now, especially this week when we got to see the one at um, 
at, wait, which school is it at? Downey. I was going to say Downey, and I was like, wait, was I at Downey? Yes, I was at Downey. So um, just, it's so exciting to see what we're doing. So that was really good. But it was just a comment, and I, I know that we, someday maybe we'll have that. Great. Uh, no further comments or questions? Uh, do I have a motion to accept the first reading of this policy? Motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. And that takes us to item number eight, board policy and AR 6200, adult education. Okay, and uh, here again, there's a new law that has been passed, and so we've updated our board policy to reflect that law. The law is AB 486. Um, the significance of this for us is that um, there's a change in immigration, uh, immigrant integration and citizenship classes that are added as courses identified for funding. Uh, other than that, all of our adult ed programs stay the same. All right. Any questions regarding this uh, policy or the AR? Well, I think that is a, that is incredible, and, and, and partly because our community, there's a lot of folks there, uh, a lot of parents that are in the category of becoming citizens in the next years, and so it is a very important for integration. So I really just want to put it out there. They, I'm glad with the law change, but I'm glad that we're also doing classes and we're, we're offering all the services to our parents because I think that also means involvement down the road in our, in our processes but also in their students' education. So uh, that's super important and it's shown over the years that that's offering those makes an impact on students' education as well. Just a Great. comment. Thank you. And I did have a question uh, that goes to the AR section and it's on page D. It's number two. And I'm having a hard time understanding. Are we charging anything for our adult education courses uh, at this time? No, we do not. Okay, so help me understand that second sentence where it says any non-immigrant enrolled. If So I think... Um, and in reading this, I think that it's referring to some of the other districts across the state do charge for their adult education. We do not. So um, for us, we, um, we will not charge them. Okay, but let me just uh, clarify for the record. It says any non-immigrant <clears throat> non enrolled in these classes shall be charged a fee to cover the full cost of the instruction, not to exceed actual cost. So what that says is that we're offering those classes not only to immigrants, but non-immigrants. And uh, so anyway, I don't know why there's that distinction, but uh, like you said, there is an option to charge for it, and we're not choosing to do that. Is that specifically just for the uh, citizenship classes? I don't think that it specifies which classes it is. We we do charge for our CNA classes, um, so we do have one class that we that we charge for, but we do not charge for these classes for English as a second language, citizenship, or our adult ed diploma track. Um, this language is in red, so that does come straight from uh, CBSA, and that's their language that we've incorporated into this um, AR. Okay. All right. I think the intent there is also to ensure that if there is, are there, if there are fees charged, that the board has 90 days before those fees are communicated to approve it. So it puts it back to the board if we ended up charging fees, but also provides there below that we can waive those for hardship. Great. All right. Any other questions regarding this board policy or the AR? Uh, seeing none. Uh, do we have a motion to accept this uh, first reading? Uh, motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. It uh, passes unanimously. And we move on now to number nine. Thank you. 
which is uh, board policy and AR 6152, changing official schedule of classes, grades 9 through 12. And this is, Good there's morning. more. Yes. Good morning, uh, Board President Brown, trustees, Superintendent Noguchi, and Cabinet. I'm here for the first reading of the proposed revision of Board Policy 6152, changing official schedule of classes grades 9 through 12, and review of the Administrative Regulation 6152 of the similar name. The, recommendation, or the recommended revisions to the BP 6152 are adopted by GAMET and represent our current practice within Modesto City Schools. Um, the BP outlines the considerations site administrators may take when assigning students to specific courses and classes, um, as well as the expectations for students to be enrolled in courses with educational content. Uh, the recommended revisions to the AR are minimal and represent the current practice at our current high schools. And I'm available for questions. Do we have any questions regarding this uh, board policy or the associated AR? Uh, Dr. Noguchi. Maestas um, just made a reference on 6152A, in the first par paragraph where it says his, her. He circled it and put there, um, which may be taken into account when determining their child's placement as opposed to his, her. All right, any other comments or questions? So with that one uh, change, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of this board policy? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Marks. And welcome, Trustee Irvin. Uh, those in favor, please indicate. Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. And for the record, we'll just note that uh, Trustee Irvin has arrived and will join in this uh, discussion. Um, next up is uh, Mr. Zierley, it looks like. Yes. Yes, we'll probably have to take a break after Mr. Zerley. <laughs> All right. So um, we move on to number 10. It's an AR uh, 1225 on the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Yes, good morning. Uh, Trust, uh, President Brown, trustees, uh, yes, I have about the next 15, so you're going to be hearing from me for, for several uh, minutes at least. So um, this is a review of recommended uh, revisions to Administrative Regulation uh, 1225 uh, for the Citizens Bond Oversight Committees. Uh, the Administrative Regulation language is attached for reference only uh, and has been reviewed um, by staff and legal counsel for consistency with our practice of the existing uh, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee and for a consolidated committee to oversee expenditures uh, for measures D, E, and L. Uh, some of the changes um, uh, is uh, we, we uh, the initial Bond Oversight Committee for measures D and E established a term of two consecutive two-year periods. Um, we're asking to revise that language to be three consecutive two-year periods in order to allow for overlap from the existing committee to the new members that are coming on, um, and also the size of the committee. Uh, the minimum size is seven um, per board um, uh, per a board workshop. The board asked for um, um, 10, but we put language in there that allows the board the ability to increase from seven um, to whatever number they're comfortable with to make sure we have um, enough representation uh, across the district. So th those are some some major revisions of the administrative regulation uh, uh, language. All right. Uh, very important and apropos to what's happening in the district right now. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, Trustee Maestas has a, a note on page D. Oh, I'll do it for him then. <laughs> uh, in the bottom paragraph, uh, <clears throat> we need a, a word there 
in lieu of uh, his, her. That's on uh, the AR page D. Yeah. I see. Bottom paragraph. His or her designee. Yep. And let's see. Uh, Trustee Marks, you have a question? I just a have comment? a question. Yes, I have a question on the AR, well, the F of AR. Just a question on, um, in that paragraph that's underlined, and we're adding, when someone is no longer serves as a representative, it says, however, that committee member shall not be entitled to serve a subsequent term as a representative of the designated group. So when we're saying that, if for some reason, let's just say they had a health issue and they needed to go off for a year, but they could come back. So that's saying they're not entitled to it. They can't expect to come back, but they could come back if the committee or the um, assignment could be that it was open seat still. I believe the intent of that language is if they're no longer, if they're, if they're, one of our, our required positions representing a group, if they're no longer part of that group, um, that's the intention of that language. If they're no longer part of a taxpayer group, um, I don't think it's if um, there's- Oh, I see, uh, okay. If, there, if there's something that causes them to no longer serve because of health issues or something. Okay, else. that makes sense. That's the, that's the intent of that language. Thank you, that's great clarification. And I have a related question also. Um, if someone is no longer part of a, a group, could they stay on the committee as an at-large member? Is there language that allows that? No, the, it's specific language in, in statute that they can serve as um, three consecutive two-year terms. Mm -hmm. um, and we tried, uh, we, we tried to get legal counsel to um, give us an opinion that because we're forming a new committee, um, then that would <clears throat> that would extend, but they they don't agree with that as well. So once once they've served their six years in this case, um, then they, they cannot serve even as a um, as one of our non represented members. So positions. let me restate my question. Let's say we've got a a parent who has a a student in the elementary district. Uh, well, let's say the high school district. Uh, if they have a student in the high school district, I guess we always have to have a parent of a, an, an elementary student on the committee. That would be correct. So let's say that the student ages out after their first term. Can that person remain on the committee as an at-large member? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, under that scenario, And then yes. we would need to appoint someone to fill the, the group. They have spot. six years, yes. They have okay. six years to serve their, their term. If they're no longer a, a representative of that group and they want to stay on as an at-large member, we would definitely welcome that, um, but find somebody else who has um, uh, a child in that, that grade level. Okay. Is there any language that would preclude that from happening? No, there is not okay. that I'm aware of. All right. And I, I definitely want to just highlight the fact that we're now able to offer three consecutive terms with the changes on, on this policy. So that's a great move. That's very support. helpful for us. So thank you for, yeah, that consideration. All right. Uh, any other questions regarding this board policy in AR? Yeah. All right, it's only in AR. It's only and in AR. Then we do not vote on this, uh, but it is coming back as... Uh, a second vote. Now this is being done basically because of it has not something to do with lack of um, participation or the pool of participants in order to you know make sure we have enough people on the on the committee. You know. No, not 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 technically. I mean, we we had um, we had full membership, seven members um, on the initial measures D and E until just recently, two of them. Two of them resigned. They, I think they moved away or relocated. Um, and so um, we felt um, for continuity, um, and because some of our members cross over as far as elementary, district, and high school representation, um, it, it would be easier for us to combine, have a consolidated committee. They still have to file separate reports. There's still technically two separate committees. But instead of two separate committees of seven people to have one, um, one committee, the board recommended 10, um, but we, it could be 14, 15, however, but we just felt operationally it was better to, to do that. 
um, than to move forward with two separate committees. Okay, and we were well within the parameters of the law legally to be able to do that, right? With this revised language in our AR, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, so uh, no need to vote on this. Uh, that takes us now to item 11, which is board policy and AR 1340, access to district records. Yes, you have uh, the first reading and review of language revising board policy 1340 for access to district records and the corresponding administ administrative regulation 1340. The revised language aligns with our current practices and reflects the requirements of the California Public Records Act pertaining to public access to public records uh, for our district. The administrative regulation is attached for reference only with suggested changes to match CSBA language, uh, and it is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 1340 access to district records. Great, do we have any questions or comments regarding this policy or the AR? Seeing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve the first reading of this board policy? Motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Lopez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries. Now we move on to <coughs> number 12. which is the sale and disposal of books, equipment, and supplies, board policy, and AR 3270. Yes, this is also the first reading and review of language revising uh, current board policy um, 3270 for sale and disposal of books, equipment, and supplies, and the corresponding administrative regulation 3270. Um, the revised language aligns with our current practice for sales of books, uh, equipment, and supplies, and the administration regulation is attached uh, for review with suggested changes that matches CSBA language. It is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3270 for the sale, disposal of books, equipment, and supplies. Great, do we have any questions or comments? Trustee Irvin. Um, Is it possible, because I was as I was reading this, is it possible to like for us to um like donate to other countries like um for for you know in that donated thing like to other countries like um I won't say necessarily Mexico because they just is uh has a especially in math further ahead than us, but um, just other maybe third world countries or not even third world countries, but co countries that may be able to utilize the educational material that we that we had to help improve their education. Um, so Trustee status. Irvin on uh, AR uh, in that new red language number four, I think specifically addresses that. It, it does reference um, children in foreign countries, um, if, if that is. Um, yeah, but I was thinking more of do we have a relationship or, you know, that we can develop to make sure there's a, a connection or so. I know we don't have like a sister city, like the city, like the city does. But. I can work. This probably would, I, this probably would run to Mr. Herb's uh, Student Support Services Division if, if if there is an opportunity for us to establish a relationship somewhere, and it could be a, a kind of a collaborative between many of our divisions to to find out if there's any um, any service groups out there or agencies that we can collaborate with. But I don't believe we currently are partners with any at the moment. I think okay, that's just a thought. <laughs> a great idea, and I, our student representative may want to take that on as a way of uh, creating some outreach. We definitely can look into those possibilities. Trustee Mejia, did you have a comment? I, I just have a comment. I, do, I think of an organization that does constant trips to, to third world countries to, to do, um, I think, um, 
Copenhagen West, they do they do a lot. Of, they already have some relationships. So I can introduce you to the person running that just to get you guys started if, if I have a starting point because they already travel there with equipment from here. And um, there, there's an idea, but I'll, I'll do it offline. And just come. Great. Thank you. Uh, interesting how sometimes we kind of weave uh, – New ideas and, and opportunities into these discussions. All right. Uh, there is a board policy here. So do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 3270? Motion by <coughs> Trustee Lopez. Lopez, second by okay. tr uh, Trustee Irvin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Those opposed? <laughs> uh, motion carries unanimously. All right, uh, moving on to number 13, board policy and AR 3280, sale or lease of district-owned real property. Mr. Zerley. Thank you. Um, this is first reading and review for language revising board policy um, 3280 for a sale or lease of district owned real property and a corresponding new language uh, for administrative regulation uh, 3280. The revised board policy language details the procedures that govern the sale or lease of real property and the new administrative regulation language is attached um, to match suggested CSBA language. Uh, the last time this board policy was updated was 1980, um, so um, the, the language reflects current practices if we ever um, have the need or interest to, to sell or lease our property. It is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy uh, 3280 for a sale or lease of district-owned real property. I have a question. Does anyone else have questions on this? On uh, BP... 3280, page B, uh, number four, I'm curious, what's the reason for this uh, date of July 1, 2024? I believe that is, um, there was provision in law that um, allowed us to um, to sell property, um, and, and that, that per particular provision of, of the regulations that uh, sunset in that year. So that's that's the reason for that um, July 1, 2024. Um, okay, so I, I, I know many times when something sunsets, there will be a renewal. So do we need to flag this uh, policy for review in 2024? We'll definitely pop up if the, if the um, regulations change or um, the statute changes. It will, we will get notification, but we can flag it. Uh, CSBA will notify us that it has changed, um, and it'll pop up for us to, to take a look at. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Marks, your question. I have a question on, so the lined out portion uh, says that in that first paragraph, is that it's page, it's a BP3280, it's the very first page, before A, this is the one, the very first page. The um, It says, vacant classrooms in operating schools shall be made available for rent or lease to other school districts, education agencies, government units, nonprofit organizations, community agencies, professional agencies. So it kind of lists off the different options. I couldn't find where CSBA had any verbiage in there, and maybe I just missed it, that allows for the lease of property more than, because it limits it to 30 days on one of these. It says limited it to 30 days, but it doesn't, it doesn't make a list of the entities that we could make our property available to because it's vacant on weekends or in the evenings um, at different school sites. So I was just wondering that if a business or a, you know, some nonprofit wanted to use it for, let's say, uh, let's just say a Saturday for instructional time and they'd like to lease it and they're a nonprofit, but I couldn't find where it allows for that. And maybe I missed it. Did I? There's a it? separate board policy for use of facilities. Oh. This is for leasing sale or leasing. So this would be uh, a long-term rental agreement or lease agreement for 
um, another agency or school district to utilize either a building or part of our campus. Um, we, we have a separate board policy for use of facilities um, that allows for exactly what you said to happen. There, there are no restrictions in there for that. Okay. So it's, it, yeah. you, you might be familiar with facility use agreements. Right, yes. Yeah. So, but this seems like, because it's all lined out, that it eliminated the option to lease it for a longer period of time. Or like, let's say they weren't doing it, they're doing it once a month on a Saturday, but they decided, hey, this is a really great program. We could do it every Saturday for a year. This doesn't allow for that. So is that in the other? That would be a facility time? use arrangement. Oh, okay. Um, which is which is covered mm -hmm. under our, and we do have that. We'll have people that say we want um, this particular Wednesday evening for the school year or whatever okay. it is. Yeah. And that's, that's a possibility. That is allowed through our facility use agreement. Okay. Just check in, because when I saw it, I said, oh, this is eliminating anybody's opportunity to be able to do that. Then I thought, CSBA may not be aware that that's an option that we'd like to have. So, okay, thank you. So just back to um, President Brown's question, I, I found the note. Um, uh, SB 98 added that, um, or, or authorizes the proceeds from the sale or lease of property purchased entirely with local funds to be used for any general fund purpose. So that that was that was put in during the flexibility time after 0708. Um, that particular SB 98 provision um, sunsets at June 30th, 23. Um, so proceeds cannot go back to the general fund um, at that point. If uh, beginning July 124, if we decide to sell or have a need to sell. Um, or, or lease any of our uh, any of our facilities, and if that changes, we'll come back and revise it. Okay. All right. So um, do we? No other questions or comments. Uh, do we have a motion to approve uh, BP thirty two eighty first reading? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Daly. All in favor? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. All right. Next, we have number 14, Board Policy and AR 3290, Gifts, Grants, and Bequests. That's also Mr. Zerley. Yes, thank you. This, again, is first reading and review of language revising. Um, current board policy 3290 for gifts, grants, and bequests, and the corresponding revisions to administrative regulation 3290. The revised board policy language authorizes the governing board to accept gifts on behalf of the district and to prescribe conditions for acceptance, uh, and the revised administration regulation language is attached that reflects um, our current district practices. It is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy um, 3290, gifts, grants uh, and bequests. On behalf of Trustee Maestas, um, and I, I spoke to you about this um, yesterday, Mr. Zerley, um, on page 3290A, the second paragraph, um, and also um, 3290B, the last paragraph, he just wants to make sure that um, the website donor's choice um, it's still uh, accessible for teachers. Um, his note here is, I don't want to make it difficult for teachers to be able to access this. So did you get a chance to take a look at that website and, it, and ensure that that, that that website is still available for um, teachers? Yes. I mean, I, I did not find anything that is excluded or not available for teachers. So Okay. All right. Thank and we'll, you. we'll watch that to make sure. But yes, I did look at that yesterday afternoon. All right. Thank you. I have a question. Does anyone else have questions before I close mine? All right. Uh, also on that same page, 3290A, uh, talks about uh, corporate sponsorships and uh, says that uh, corporate sponsorships can be used for uh, sponsorship of an educational, athletic, or other program or activity. Do we make that a practice in our district now? Do we have any corporate sponsored events or activities? I am none come to mind in my time here. Um, and I don't know that we have any sponsored activities, corporate sponsored activities, but I would defer to my educational experts 
um, if there's something I, I don't know about. No, I don't. I'm trying to rack my brain through it. I don't believe we do. The only thing that I can think of that comes close is when we uh, cooperate with the Chamber of Commerce or some other agencies uh, on like the AgAware bunch and things of that sort. Was your, was your question corporation letter corporation? We definitely have um, situations to where we work hand in hand with corporations and community, but it's not corporation sponsored, so to speak. As yeah. yeah, there, there are donations. I think we use the term sponsor loosely. You know, someone makes a donation, they're advertised on a placemat at a fundraiser, or there's an athletic tournament and uh, local businesses may donate money to uh, to the cause to help with awards or offset costs or, or have advertising. Um, An example might be that CTE event we just hosted down at the plaza where we had a lot of corporate and, and uh, you know, chamber of commerce, you know, type sponsors to help with that. Okay, good. Thank so, you. And then I just remember when we were, um, we had sponsors or donations coming in from trades that wanted to do our scoreboard at one of our football stadiums. And we had to, we as a board had to have that discussion on how large the emblem could be on there from them because there was a concern that if we, because we didn't have to pay any money at all, but it was, and it was great. It was awesome because we didn't have a scoreboard. It was a new stadium and we needed a scoreboard. And so they donated it, but we made their logo on it not too big and made sure that was a big discussion here. To ha So what if, you know, what if the future, you know, we have another opportunity to do this. So we kind of decided that that was what, and that kind of fit with this because it was the agreement and the board ensures that that relationship is a good one, but also allows that they aren't getting too much publicity for their uh, donation and it's promoting something. And we always wanted to make sure it wasn't something that we didn't agree with as a board. If somebody from <laughs> some entity in the community that was, you know, saying, hey, we want to donate from, I could suggest one that are, you know, it's the new thing now uh, with um, different products that students could uh, get access to and we don't want their money. So we say, no, we don't, we don't accept this. But it was a good discussion. So I think this outlines it really well for us in the future. All right, any other comments or questions? So uh, this was uh, board policy and AR 3290. Do we have a motion to approve the first reading of this board policy? I move approval. Uh, motion by Trustee Marks. I saw Trustee Lopez's hand first, so second by Trustee Lopez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. And we'll now move to item number 15, which is Board Policy 3300, Expenditures and Purchases. Mr. Zerley. Yep, uh, this is first reading and review of language revising board policy 3300 for expenditures and purchases. Um, the revised board policy language has been approved by financial services staff and purchasing department and reflects our current district practices. Um, there is no um, attached AR, there's no coordinating AR to this board policy. Um, it is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3300 expenditures and purchases. Any questions regarding this board policy? Do we have a motion to approve the first reading of uh, board policy 3300? Aye. Uh, motion by Trustee Irvin, second by Trustee Lopez or Mejia, <laughs> a combined effort. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, number 16, board policy 3510. This is a new policy regarding green school operations. This represents the first reading and review of board policy 3510 as new. 
board policy language for green school operations. Um, the CSBA language has been reviewed by our sustainability and adaptation department and includes revisions to reflect our current practices. Um, it is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3510 for green school operations. Any questions? Uh... Yeah, excuse me. Um, two, on behalf of Trustee Maestas, on page B9, um, the second, um, actually 9B, um, there's a comment. It says, how does this affect new purchases? So using reduced or zero emission school buses and vehicles, <laughs> battery um, electric machinery, such as tractors and riding mowers and battery powered landscape tools, and providing a, um, accompanying infrastructure such as charging stations. So his question is, how does this affect new purchases? So there isn't um, an attached administrative regulation for this particular board policy, but our current practice is um, as funding is available. So as you know, with our, our um, electric buses, with some of our um, items listed here with um, riding lawnmowers and battery powered landscaping tools, we've been able to be the beneficiary of um, of getting money to help purchase offset the cost of those. Um, until we see the the initial cost, I mean, come down to where it, it matches or is close to its, you know, fuel burning counterpart, um, we're limited by the funds available. So if there's funds, if there's, if we can uh, access funds to help with that purchase, we're definitely, that our first uh, priority would be to um, battery powered or electric powered um, units as, as identified, but until we get more consistent funding sources, it, it's not 100% that way. So I think it already addresses that in this policy in a, in a way. On the first page, that last paragraph before district strategies, it says, in selecting and prioritizing strategies, the superintendent designee shall give consideration to long-term potential cost savings, initial costs, feasibility of implementation, quality and performance of the product or service, health impacts, environmental considerations, and potential educational value. So to me, it addresses you know, your future and what you're planning to do, and you're taking into consideration the cost savings and all the other impacts it might have in a good way. So is it going to work for us? So to me, I think it addresses that without having to add another statement that says that. But I also want to just make a comment. I really like the first sentence. I always like it when they... And you know, before I've asked, can we add it back as a section when we took it out? But I like it where it says the governing board believes everyone has a responsibility to be a steward of the environment and desires to integrate environmental accountability into all district programs and operations. So I just appreciated the fact that CSBA put that statement in there. And they don't always think to do that, but it's nice that they did it on this one. The second question he had was 9D, and that is... Um, uh, it's, it's just referring to idling vehicles, and his question is, does this exist now as far as signage at our school sites? It, it does not, and I've, I've spoke to Mr. Orth about the signage. Um, we are obviously in our infancy stage of this program, um, and but they are, we will, Roger, will be getting signage up that um, advises, uh, bless you, advises our, um, you know, our visitors to our campuses, even our own employees. Um, with, with signage that, that will help promote this as well. Yeah. We do not have any at the moment. Because okay, my question remain, relates to that as well as an additional one. Um, if we could possibly put in encouraging the, un, uh, encouraging mm. the unnecessary idling of personal uh, vehicles um, and, you know, come up with a little marketing strategy to to do that in terms of, um, we call that in my business, engine off compliance. And so um, the same thing, how are we uh, limiting on number on C, limiting unnecessary idling of school buses mm -hmm. in accordance with um, that uh, CCR as well. So I don't know if our buses are equipped with, um, with, uh, with ours, if there's a, um, a little monitor on them. And it tells us who, you know, our goal with Amazon is 75% engine off, you know, rate, you know, and that helps in terms of safety, somebody jumping in the vehicle, taking off, also the carbon footprint and all of that stuff as well um, when we, you know, when we do that. So 
I don't know if establishing a, a engine off rate or idling rate um, for our for our district or our drivers would be also beneficial uh, to to um, help us reduce those emissions. Right, and and school buses, and I, I think I hear you saying two different things. Um, school buses are under the 13 CCR 2480. So if, if you're ever at a school site and you notice a school bus or even at a bus stop, a school bus pulls up to load, unload students or is waiting, they have to shut off their bus. They That's a requirement in California with diesel engine burning um, engines is they have to they have to turn off their engine um, while they're waiting to either load or unload their students. But um, a, a point I think you, you may be making is our white vehicles, our maintenance vehicles, others, you know, we don't have anything that, that governs mm -hmm. them. So that's something we we'll want to look at um, encouraging or adding to this to make sure that you know, that maintenance vehicle doesn't leave um, the vehicle running while they, they run into the office or, or wherever they're at on the school site. Those are things we can definitely improve on. Okay. And that's why limiting, using the word limiting, um, you can't really, how do you do that? You know, but when you say encourage the limitation or whatever language we use, encouraging the limiting of unnecessary um, idling, to me reflects a reflects a, a, a more appropriate uh, strategy. So encouraging yeah. is stated in that in that paragraph. Is oh. that would you like it moved up? Is that oh okay okay oh yeah that's a, unnecessary encouraging unnecessary idling okay. I'm going to finish my Estes. Yes. Um, what about the trash cans? <laughs> what about the trash cans that are compliance that are in compliance with state laws for disposal, such as black, green, and blue? Is that also um, uh, part of the school system? Not, that's a residential service um, requirement. Um, we do have some voluntary. Uh, some of our school sites have some voluntary recycling programs. Um, that that are are there. The only the only really organic waste service that we do is in our nutrition services program, the cafeterias. Um, that's required by law, but um, we do not have the separate colored bin service like our residential homeowners have. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, that's something that Dr. Noguchi has um, stressed is that we need a district wide recycling program. Uh, but we have one bin. We have one large bin. Um, and unless somebody on this site takes the time to separate it, it doesn't get done. Um, and, and it doesn't even get hauled off separately by the city. So at the moment, no. Trustee Daly, I think you were oh. first. So I notice on the, um, the food policy, the district food service programs, it does specifically state providing fresh, locally sourced, unprocessed organic foods, including plant-based options. So it states there locally. I'd like to see when it talks about the students, the green practices for the schools to have that as well when it, when it comes to a school project or something like that. When available, it needs to be local. For example, yeah, can I have an products example, please? and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I, that makes sense. I'm, I'm sorry. I, can, I don't quite understand this. I'm, and I'm not <coughs> a subject matter expert on school projects, I got to admit, um, or at least student projects. Um, so it, if, if I understand right, if, if we're doing a project, a student, if students are involved in a project at a particular school, then they should be encouraged to follow this same um, locally sourced. Um, language that's in here for our nutrition right. services program? Ten, well, 10, because 10 says specifically food services right. program. Uh -huh. So under 11, I would think that it would be a more appropriate spot to oh. put for like assignments and things along that lines. They should be encouraged to use local sources. Okay, so expand well. number 11. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, I didn't see that um, school practices there. Are we recommending language or just to, that that be addressed? Okay. All right. Uh, trying to see, uh, Trustee Marks, you had a question or a comment? Yes. Just so I, when I was on the, um, I want to say civic learning project with um, in Sacramento with the people around the state, they 
there were opportunities, and I, and I believe our school district participated in one of them, but I got to evaluate different schools, and it was so amazing to see different ideas from students on how to recycle things in this, at the school site. And so some students set up the trash bins at their school. This was before we had things like we do now with the different um, cans that we have now. But they, at one of our school sites, we had the students just decide that they wanted to figure out what to do with the leftover food because it was such a big deal to them that students were throwing away apples and bananas and things you know, at lunch. And so they set up this recycling. And then I learned later when I went to the, the city that with the new state requirements that we had to have a certain percentage of our um, pr any garbage that comes from our school site turned into organic waste because of the new requirements uh, at the waste facility as well because they were trying to re meet the state guidelines. But it allowed for the city to actually take our organic waste, turn it into um, mulch and put and sell it to the community as um, I can't think of what you do when you put compost, compost material. So it was really a great partnership. I don't know if we're still doing that. I, I just observed it and heard the staff member from the city report on it, and it was very encouraging to me that we were working with the city to help with the recycling. So I'm hoping that with this, as we implement this, um, we can see if our students want to do some recycling ideas and come up with their own ideas on the elementary campuses where this happened, which I thought was really encouraging to see students come up with their own ideas on how can we do this better as a school district. And they got awards for you know working on it by the county. The county had a program to do that. So just saying it. So we are participating in that. I mean, each one of our school cafeterias has their own separate um, bin for organic um, compost that that is separate from the the trash bin. So we are we are doing that at each one of our our school cafeterias. What we don't have is the the blue recycling container that that you have, um, you know, at your house as well. All right. Any other comments or questions? So we've uh, made some recommendations for some changes. Would anyone like to propose? Uh, Adoption of the first reading with these uh, changes that will show up on the second reading. Motion by Trustee Nadia. Second by Trustee Daly. Those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Next, we move on to number 17. Board policy and AR 3511.1, integrated waste management. This is also a new policy. Yes, this um, as well is the first reading and review of board policy 3511.1 as new board policy language for integrated waste management and the corresponding new language for administrative regulation um, 3511.1. The recommended CSBA language has been re reviewed by our Sustainability and Adaptation Department and aligns to our current practices. Uh, the administration regulation language has been reviewed and is attached for reference only. Uh, it is recommended to approve the first reading of Board Policy 3511.1 for integrated waste management. Any questions or comments regarding this? Do we have a, a motion to Approve the board policy 3511.1, Integrated Waste Management. I motion. motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Aye. 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 I believe that passes unanimously. Okay. One page down. We're a third of the way, folks. Let's keep going. All right. The number 18 is board policy and exhibit 3512 equipment. And this is a new board policy. Mr. Zerley. For your review is the first reading and review of board policy um, 3512 as new board policy language for equipment. Uh, the recommended CSB language. Um, aligns to the California School Accounting Manual and our current practices for distinguishing uh, between equipment and supplies for our district. 
It is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3512 for equipment. Do we have any questions or comments related to this board policy? Do we have a motion to approve board policy and exhibit 3512 equipment, the first reading? I'll second. Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We have another new uh, AR uh, and exhibit 3517 facil facilities inspection, also new. Yes, this is a review of language uh, for new administrative regulation 3517 uh, facilities inspection. Um, as part of the Williams litigation settlement, it, Settlement Education Code requires that each school district uh, participating in the in the school facility program have a facility inspection system in place uh, for all schools to ensure that school facilities are kept uh, in good repair. Um, Education Code defines good repair to mean that facility is maintained in a manner that ensures it is clean, safe, and functional um, as determined pursuant to the facility inspection tool. Uh, the Administrative regulation, uh, CSB language is attached, has been reviewed by our maintenance and operations department uh, for consistency with our current practices. All right, do we have any questions regarding this AR and exhibit? I just have a comment that I've noticed that we are already taking care of some of these things, including the gas leaks. <laughs> so, <laughs> that we thought we're taken care of because anyway that was an interesting week all right that is a ar so we will not uh, take a motion on that one we'll move on now to <coughs> number 20 board policy and ar 3523 electronic signatures this is a new policy yes this is first reading and review of board policy 3523 as new board policy language uh, for electronic signatures and the corresponding new language for administrative regulation 3523. Uh, public entities are permitted to use digital signatures in our communications and operations. The new recommended CSBA language has been reviewed by staff um, and reflects our current practices. The administra administrative regulation has been reviewed and is attached for reference only. Uh, it is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3523 for electronic signatures. Do we have any questions or comments regarding this policy? Do we have a motion to approve board policy 3523 first reading uh, for electronic signatures? This is uh, board policy 3523. Motion by Trustee Lopez, second by Trustee Mejia. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Next, we have an item number 21, board policy and AR 3550, food service child nutrition program, Mr. Zerley. This is the first reading and review of language revising board policy 3550 for our food service child nutrition programs and the corresponding administrative regulation 3550. Uh, the revised language aligns with recommended CSBA language and our current nutrition services practices. Uh, the administrative regulation language has been revised and is attached for reference only. Uh, it is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3550 for food service child nutrition program. Um, there, there's three of these in a row for the child nutrition program. And, and just, just to throw out some information, uh, we are currently what is called a CEP provision. Where, um, that means every one of our students um, is served a meal at no cost. Um, we do still have to certify um, our, the eligibility of our students. Um, we are currently in the fourth year of our, cert we, our certification. So every four years, we have to, we have to do this um, the certification um, in, into the National School Lunch Program because that determines the amount of reimbursement we receive. Um, but there's also a different certification done for local control funding formula as well. So sometimes those get confused. We still have to every four years 
uh, in order to establish our base, um, collect information uh, from our families for the, the, the Federal Nutrition Services Lunch Program. All right. Any questions or comments regarding this board policy? I just have a question on procedure for the students. So just because I'm unaware, are, do all of our students have a card that they use so that we know they're accessing to the food um, so we can get reimbursed? Or do we just count how many students take Great it? question. Um, no, we do not have any identif identifying forms of, of students, and that way students know who is or who isn't. Every student has a number. Um, so a, as if you ever, um, I would encourage you to go watch one of our, our lunch, uh, at least know. one of our high schools. They'll punch in a number. Everybody has their own number. That number determines um, who the student is, what they're eligible for, um, and, and so it, it tracks it that way. There are no um, personal, uh, anything that identifies one student from another in this particular program, other than their own personal number that they punch in. Okay, so before they go through the line, they just punch in their number. Is that correct? Once they get to the end, yes. Oh, okay, huh? okay. I was just curious. Yes. Only because my students, I remember when mine were at Meta So High and how they did, you know, how that worked then, but this is so different Because there now. are restrictions or there are, there are certain things they have to take or not take, um, and so that'll, that'll notify the nutrition services worker if, you know, everything, oh. um, you know, has been, you know, has been received by the student. So. Okay, okay, that's good. Thank you. That was helpful. All right, any other comments or questions regarding this board policy? Finding my location. So this is board policy 3550, mm -hmm. Food Service Child Nutrition Programs. Do we have a motion to approve the first reading of this policy? I move approval. Motion by Trustee Marks, uh, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. We move on to number 23, no, 22, uh, board policy and AR 3551, food service operations and cafeteria fund. The first reading and review of language revising board policy 3551 for our food service operations cafeteria fund uh, and the corresponding administrative regulation 3551. Uh, the revised language does align with CSBA language and our current practices as reviewed by our Nutrition Services Department. Uh, the administrative regulation uh, language has been revised and is attached for reference only. Um, it is recommended to approve the first reading of Board Policy 3551 uh, for food service operations and establishing a cafeteria fund. All right, do we have any questions or comments regarding this uh, board policy and AR? For, for clarification, on the first page at the bottom, it's those are going to be combined, right? So it says meals may be sold to district employees, board members, et cetera. That is correct. The way it works is the lined out language um, is going to be removed when you see it next time, and then it'll It'll be maybe sold to district employees, board members. That's why I wanted to clarify, because then I don't have to ask it multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy uh, 3551, Food Service Operations and Cafeteria Fund? Motion by Trustee Mejia. Second by Trustee Daly. Those in favor? Uh, aye. Motion carries unanimously. And next we move on to, if I can get my eyes to work with the, the similar items here. Okay, number 23, Board Policy and AR 3553. Free and reduced priced meals. This is uh, the first reading and review of language revising board policy 3553 for free and reduced price meals and the corresponding administrative regulation 3553. Um, the language has been revised and aligns with uh, CSBA language and our current practices for uh, nutrition services. 
The administrative le regulation language has been revised and is attached for reference only. Again, just a quick note, uh, AB 130, um, this new law requires districts with a high poverty school uh, defined as a school that is eligible to, to participate in the community eligibility uh, provision um, to adopt a universal meal service provision. We do that across the district. So um, even our schools that aren't identified um, as a high poverty school, every student in our district um, receives um, a, a free meal under this uh, community eligibility provision. It is recommended to approve the first reading of board policy 3553 for free and reduced price meals. Any questions? Uh, I just, I'm just appreciative because I feel like this is incredible as, as for, for kids and then also they don't feel like, you know, singled out sometimes and all that stuff. I think it's, it's an awesome, I just want to commend, you know, our school is doing, for doing that and hoping that never changes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vice President Irvin, you had a comment? Oh, I just wanted to comment and ask, um, what is the, even though we do it for all of our students, what is the percentage rate um, of considered uh, high poverty schools in terms of how many, how many, what percentage of students have to be, uh, meet that criteria for that school to be designated? Um, current, um, it, prior to AB 130, AB 130 lowered the threshold to 40 percent. Um, so um, we're hearing a lot of concerns from some of our wealthy um, districts that, that are in the state of California. Um, but before that, um, I believe it was around 60 percent um, was the threshold um, for that. But um, AB, AB 130 has, has lowered that threshold um, to now 40 percent. Any other comments? What percentage are we at? Um, it, for our high school district, combined for our for our, our high schools, um, we're uh, in the around 67, 68 percent. For but our elementary district is 88 percent. Um, those are combined, so th that's an average. Um, but that's that's where we currently stand. But in this period of high inflation, it's nice to know that we're helping our families with their food budgets by not uh, requiring any payment for for meals and, breakfast and, and snacks and that we were able to do that as well during covid pass out thousands hundreds of thousands of lunches and dinners for them so that was really special and and again i uh, yes we we get reimbursed on the fact that is the is the family eligible or not so when when we have what would be otherly other classified as paid students, we don't we don't receive reimbursement uh, for that. Um, we've we're, our nutrition service program is is so well run. Um, it's about a million and a half dollar loss for us to provide it across the district, but the benefits far outweigh um, the the cost for us to do that. Uh, we can operate, we can continue to operate um, this way, um, but um, it, it really has been um, you know an advantage for all of our families um, in the district. So when we are able to offer meals in the summertime, is that with this program as well? Yeah. So we had a, I mean, we had a special provision um, during the pandemic. Whether that continues into this summer or not is still to be determined. Uh, but yes, it, all of our meal service falls under the federal um, guidelines for for um, the National School Lunch Program. It's called School Lunch Program, but it includes breakfast, lunch, snacks as well. Great. Trustee Mahead, did I steal your thunder? <laughs> yeah. We're able to utilize our our reimbursement rate, the especially the elementary with the higher, the much higher eighty eight, you know, ninety percent reimbursement rate in order to do that across the district and the community during the summertime. So we, we do take advantage of that. That's great. And I, I know the community is very grateful for that. Thank you for sharing. I didn't know that there was a cost that we were taking for doing that for all of our students. And so that's just helpful to know that we're providing such a great thing. Because I get comments out in the public about, you know, what are you doing about the students? And, you know, some people think, why is the school feeding them? And I tell them, 
I think the schools should be. I said these students come to school without breakfast. Sometimes they don't get lunch either. And so I think it's such a great way for our students to, and it affects their learning ability, it affects so many uh, aspects of their growth. And so I'm, so I'm defending it <laughs> as they go out there in certain areas. And it's just really good that we are doing it because we care about our students. We want them to come to school with the, and have a full belly to be able to learn and and grow in in all aspects. So I just think it's great that we're doing that. So thank you. Trustee Maya. I saw your hand. <laughs> all right. I just I, want, I want to comment in agreement with Trustee Marks. We, when I was growing up, we were on the cusp of, so just like a few dollars over what was allowed for a free lunch. And some of the time we would go hungry. So I absolutely 100% think this is appropriate and appreciate it. So uh, from what I hear, I think this would be appropriate for us to possibly put out a press release at some point and to highlight the fact that we are doing that and as a destination district, we offer it many times or, and wouldn't hurt to indicate that we're doing it as an expense to the district to share it with all students. Yeah, um, same thing. I'm glad it's for all students because that way it, it, it comes into the equity issue of it. So it's equitable across the board for all students. I know growing up um, after junior, after elementary school, I did not turn that form in. So junior high and high school, I did not turn that form in for, for free lunch mm -hmm. because of the stigma it carried, you know, back then about you being on free lunch or free breakfast or any of those things. So this way, there's no stigma attached to it. You know, it's open to all. So Equity question, you know, answered. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Noguchi, did I see? You? No, okay. Uh, thank you for the participation on this item. Um, do we have a motion to approve uh, board policy 3553 free and reduced lunch priced meals as a first reading? Motion by Trustee Mejia. <laughs> Had to hurry on that one. Trustee Mark, second. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries. I think that was a, a resounding aye. All right. Mr. Zerli, are you getting tongue tied yet? Not yet. This is fun. All right. You're doing well. Okay. We'll move to no, two more. Number 24. This is the first reading and review of language revising uh, board policy 7110 for our facilities master plan. Uh, the revised board policy language um, has been reviewed by facility staff um, and, and also matches the, the current um, changes to the building code and does reflect our current district practices. Um, one of the, the changes um, is under the um, California Green Building Standards Code, so we are now we are now, as of all of our new projects um, that are, are being approved, are under Title 24, Part 11, uh, or the Cal Green, which is establishes mandatory requirements and voluntary standards for green building, which apply to all new construction um, and is applicable to across TK through 12th grade. So um, that's, that's the biggest change here. We had just uh, updated this in 2020, but we are now under the new California Green Code standards when it comes to designing, uh, planning, and constructing our buildings. It is recommended to approve the first reading uh, board policy 7110 uh, for facilities master plan. Do we have any questions regarding this board policy? So do we have a motion uh, to approve the first reading of board policy 7110? Uh, Vice President Irvin. <laughs> Second by Trustee Mejia. And uh, pleased that we have the opportunity to do many facilities master plans right now and uh, incorporate all these new things. Uh, thank you uh, to the public for passing our bonds. Uh, so I know, but I did want to get that statement in there first. Board policy 7110. Those, uh, let, let's take a vote to approve. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. That uh, 
passes unanimously. We're on number 25. So this so one um, policy will be quick. Sorry. and AR 7150 site selection and development. Yeah, this one will be quick. And my apologies um, to the board. Uh, and this popped up as uh, being new, but we actually approved this in August. The last time we did, um, we, we did one of these Saturday workshops. So the language here that that you see in red is already part of our board policy that's been approved by the board. So there is no need. Um, to revise this one and again my apologies for not catching that sooner. Okay, so do we not need to take action? There's no changes Already approved okay. Good job and mr. Rich looks like he's excited to get going, but uh, we need to take a break first Let's take what ten minutes
Yes, we're back in session. We'll hit the gavel just for fun. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rich, tell us about math first. Oh, uh, so uh, today is the uh, Stanislaus County Math Council, uh, uh, what's called the Math Super Bowl. It's for grades 7 through 12. It makes it sound really exciting, but there's a bunch of kids there taking a math test right now. <laughs> so uh, uh, during COVID, it was not, uh, the Stanislaus Math Council did not host it. And so it's been tough for us as a, as a committee to kind of get that back. Last year, we only had two high schools show up. So this year, we have four high schools that are represented, uh, all of them Modesto City Schools high schools. Uh, Modesto City is, is hosting and, uh, and, and uh, paying for all the facility costs so that it lowers the cost of the school sites. So it only, it's only costing about $3 a kid for the schools to participate to just help pay for the trophies or anything. So we've got uh, Enox, Gregory, uh, Mohai, and uh, Downey participating there. And then a couple of junior high kids came as well. And uh, they'll take two tests. One is what's called the BOM, which is a five-person test where they have to kind of decide which question they think they can best answer. It's a team made up of uh, students representing algebra, geometry, algebra two pre-cal, and calculus. You have to have a member from all those disciplines on the team. And then after that test is an individual test based on whatever course they're in. And then we'll do a award ceremony after that. So hoping in the, in the near future to have a better turnout, but we're happy that we, have, we doubled what we had last year, so. Well, we'll look forward to hearing the results. Mm -hmm. All right. I guarantee a Modesto High School will win. That's <laughs> <laughs> all that's there. No, a, a Modesto City High School will win. Oh. Oh. That's what I meant to say. I realized that I missed a word there. I meant I guarantee that one of our schools will win. Okay. Yeah. Oh. High school yeah, will win. Great. All right. So uh, let's move on to item number 26. They are and exhibit 2, 1312.4. Williams Uniform Complaint Procedures. So no board policy, but this is a... Correct, yeah. This is just the AR and the exhibit. Uh, this is These are regularly updated, almost on a yearly basis, based on whatever new laws come out. Uh, you'll notice that some of the language in this AR is similar to the language from Tim's 3517 regarding facilities inspection. Uh, those really go hand in hand with the Williams uh, procedure for not only curriculum, but as well as facilities. And so this is just the first reading of Again, updating the new law with, uh, updating the, excuse me, the AR with the new language from the law. Okay. Uh, recommend, and again, this one is just an AR. And do we have any questions or comments regarding this AR? We will not take action since it's an AR. Um, thank you for presenting that. We'll now move to item number 27. Board policy and AR 5148.3, preschool, early childhood education. So board policy 5184.3 and the corresponding AR include information regarding our district's early childhood education, Head Start, and state preschool programs and describes the eligibility and enrollment requirements and how services must be provided to our preschool age students. So this board policy was last approved in April of last year. It has been updated to reflect new state law to revise and update requirements for California state preschool programs relating to dual language learners, as well as children with exceptional needs and enrollment data collection and reporting uh, to the CDE. So it's the, the AR is new, so you'll notice that that uh, language is just reflects the gamut language, which includes the new and existing laws and, and regulations regarding ECE programs. And the recommendation is that we approve the first reading of uh, BP and AR 5148.3. The only comment, um, Mr. Rich, is at the end of the second line. We shouldn't have a comment, a comma right there. That's just a format. End heading. of the second line. The acquisition of instructional knowledge, comma skills, not instructional, comma knowledge, comma. Got it. I what see what page are we looking at, please? Uh, I, I, the first page, sec the second line. The second line. So it, it should read an acquisition acquisition of instructional knowledge, comma skills, comma and abilities. Got it. The commas were in a coma that day. I, I feel like I missed something in the early uh, early hours of this day. Okay, 
So that is a board policy. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, do we have a motion to approve the board policy 5148.3? Motion by Trustee Daly. <laughs> a, a second by Trustee Mejia. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And now we move to 28. Board policy 6142.5, environmental education. So this is the first reading of BP 6142.5. Environmental education. Uh, this was last revised in February of 2020. Uh, this revision, uh, you'll also notice some similar language from a, a policy 3510, which uh, Mr. Zidley had looked at earlier. When we're talking about the um, sustainability and green measures, this this is the curriculum side of that. And so this, particularly the updates in here, address the need or the opportunity to provide not only professional development teachers, but as well as encouraging environmental education throughout multiple disciplines. Uh, throughout the, the course of study. And it's uh, it's recommended that we approve the first reading of BP 6142.5. All right, uh, any questions or comments? I just want to uh, talk about my comment from earlier from that portion that you're talking about where this may be a, a better area to add that the local locally sourced items for educational purposes rather than the other portion, I don't know. You guys can decide that part. All right, any, any other comments or questions? So I, I have a question, and it's not regarding this particular policy, but in a paragraph where we see crossouts and red, I have a hard time making my eyes read it. Is it possible to have that paragraph restated um, in the context? I'm talking about in the future. Yeah, yeah. The purpose of this is to show, you know, current language, recommended language, and then striked out would be language that we're saying. Hey, yeah, let's, so what, let's what would be helpful for me would be when we have a, like a paragraph that's mixed with crossouts and inserts, if we could follow it with maybe an inserted uh, paragraph that's just the new language. That way we can see what the grammar is and make sure what we're seeing. Just for visual convenience. I know it is tough and it, it does, but I do, I appreciate that it's written in this way. I know it would be really difficult for staff to retype all of it again. I guess because when you go through it, you have to line out what we say and then what we don't want. So I'm I'm still okay with it. I've been doing it. For, you know, we've had to do this for like 25 years. And I appreciate the fact that we have it. We didn't used to have the CSBA language in red. That's really helped me a lot because uh -huh. I didn't know that was CSBA language. I just knew we were adding it and used to just be in bold. So we just do, we just used to do bold and then, uh, and line out. And so, but I like the red because it at least lets me know what CSBA's ideas are too. What we can what we can do for ones where it's because we've been doing it all morning, right? Yeah. Where it's substantive, where it really is a whole law, you know, very integrated paragraph, kind of like the the board bylaw that we're all going to talk about at the end. We could provide a separate sheet on that side, so we still keep this the same. And then for paragraphs that are really long and choppy like that, then we could provide the paragraph as a whole for, for ones like, the, for, that's yeah. as long as this one. Right. When it's just like the second paragraph, that one is much smaller and it's easier to track. Oh, yeah. when, but the, the first one, when it's at that length, yes. so that's that staff, um, just as we move forward with our next Saturday, which isn't until October, um, which we got a ways out, but we can we can accommodate that. I understand yeah. that. Okay. That's it is, it is. It is hard to read it, but it does help. So Very specific, great. Trustee Daly, did your comment get uh, addressed? Is there some uh, specific change you want to recommend? Yeah, no, it was in reference to the one that I talked about earlier where it was under the green section for the buildings. 
talking about um, utilizing locally sourced items for educational purposes mm -hmm. because that was specific to food services. So I was just making a statement where this is here, maybe it would be a better portion of the board policies for that to be in this section rather than that section over there. Yeah, it could be both places. So any language that we need to send back with Mr. Rich for that or mm -hmm. where what is it we're going to be adding? I will work with Mr. Rich on what we're adding for the other one to see where it fits in, in this board policy. If, if that pleases the board, I'll, I'll take what was suggested from the prior one and work with Mr. Rich on that. Okay. On, on page A, there's a portion where you can maybe just put environmentally based learning experiences locally sourced when available or something along that lines. Yeah, we can work on that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure the language is common between 3510 and uh, 6142.5. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 6142.5 environmental education? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Daly. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Number 29, courses of study. Board policy 6143. So uh, board policy 6143, course of study was adopted in February of 2020. And uh, the changes today uh, just represent new language, uh, particularly around on the first page uh, in regards to um, the district shall not require or refuse participation and then it bases it, it goes to list the, the law and the ed code regarding uh, different student groups. All right, do we have any questions? Uh, I have one, any others? Comment. Comments? Just a comment, I appreciate that on the second page we're adding back, adding in career skills, integrated academic and career skills, which I think is extremely helpful for where we're headed in our district right now. So I had a question uh, regarding the bottom page on the first page, uh, bottom paragraph on the first page. Um, how does this apply to uh, physical education credit that students receive for participating <coughs> in sports that are specific to gender? Uh, so our, our current board policy regarding um, uh, PE requirement or PE credit, if you will, for sports. I don't believe it It specifies the gender. It just the credit for the course would be, for each sport, in this case, if it's an after-school sport, it would be 2.5 credits regardless of the student participating. That's how the credits would be rewarded. Am I understanding that question correctly? No, it, it says that... Uh... District should not provide any course separately or require or refuse participation by any student on the basis of the student's actual perceived sex, sexual orientation, gender. So what I'm wondering is if there is a, a girls volleyball team, are we in violation of this if the student receives academic credit for participating on that team? I'm looking over maybe in Brad from an athletic standpoint. I, I don't see any violation there. No, I don't either. Okay. So on behalf of Trustee Maes, as he said, um, on this very last paragraph, the same one that you're referring to, this is a this is good, this must remain. He was felt felt very strongly that this language needed to be included in here. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, losing my place. That's uh, board policy 6143. Do we have a motion to approve the first reading? Motion. By Trustee Mejia, motion. second by Trustee Daly. All those in favor? Aye.
Okay, so we'll note that that uh, is motion carries, but not unanimously. And moving now to board policy 4131, staff development, Mr. Rich. So board policy 4131, and then the two subsequent policies, 4231 and 4331, uh, are currently in our board policies are one board policy, last updated in 1982, and uh, uh, composed of one single sentence, which you'll see at the beginning of each one of these is, is striked out, that black line. So we've broken these into uh, three different board policies representing classified, certificated, and management. That's the, the difference between the three uh, here. And then also included gamut suggested language, as well as our current practice for professional development, which has significantly changed since 1982. Okay. So will we need to present for each one of these? We do need to take a separate vote. Yeah, each one is, a, is going to be a separate one, correct. But just kind of some background on all three of okay. them because they, they look very similar. All right. So with regard to Board Policy 4131, any questions or comments? So on behalf of um, Trustee Maestas, there were a couple places throughout all three that he is requesting um, the words research-based. For instance, on the, the second page, number two, use effective research-based um, subject-specific uh, methodologies. And there's like four places that he wants to be able to put research-based in that, which is what we currently do. So um, I talked to uh, Mr. Rich yesterday on, on those areas so he knows where those are at. Okay. I will agree with that. I think that... That was a good addition. What about evidence base? Or do we utilize? I would say research base and evidence base is the same thing. It's, I mean, it's, it's evidence showing that it's successful, right? Right. And research is, you know, research. It's, how about, it's whatever I mean, you guys want. I, yeah, don't, I, mean, I don't care where this is the word. Evidence is. base. How about research uh, slash evidence base? I think based? evidence. Evidence-based meaning there that's based on outcomes yeah. or some yeah. longitudinal outcomes of that research. Yes, I Whatever agree. We want. Yeah. <clears throat> I am going to say I agree with Trustee Irvin. So I would push back and say research, uh, just because I mean I mean we're really going into detail of evidence. The evidence might say something does not mean that it's proved that it's that it's correct, right? So I my evidence shows that more people eat ice cream. Know, in, in June, right? But based well, it's on based research, on the research, which leads to the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Order, you gotta you gotta do the research in order to get to the evidence. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> from a from a uh, let me see from a you know, like I said, you know, if you're doing research on a research project, your hope is to have evidence. When you present that, you're presenting the you're presenting the evidence based on the research that you've done. So after my research, this is, this is what that research led to. Here's the evidence that this research that I've done works. <clears throat> so may I make a suggestion? So may we add, and we'll vote on this because it sounds like there's a little bit of different agreement, research slash evidence-based. So it'll be both of those words together. Is that okay with Trustee Irvin and Trustee... Um, <laughs> Lopez? No, for me, for me. I was going to say Adolfo. Uh, have them both there. I have another comment about this. So let's, let's have a vote on, on just on that language, even just a thumbs up. Okay. Are we, are we in agreement the to two move words. forward with those two words? Okay. Okay.
Yeah, I think if you look at number four on page A of 4131, Bullet four says sensitivity to and ability to meet the needs of diverse student populations, including but not limited to uh, students with characteristics specified in Ed Code uh, 200. And, and then that Ed Code is the one that lists all the different student groups. Yeah. I think that would, I think that would fall underneath that bullet. So, Mr. Rich, are you suggesting that we could add those two words in that, in that uh, paragraph? Or that we... uh, I'm suggesting that that would currently fall within the realm of that, of what number four says. Are you okay with that? All right. Uh, any other comments or suggestions? Questions? All right. Uh, so with the uh, recommendation, and uh, recommended addition, uh, do we have a motion to approve the First reading of board policy 4131. I move approval. By Trustee Mark, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries. All right, next we have board policy 4231. So board policy 4231 is staff development for classified staff. So we just saw the one for certificated. Again, this is uh, last updated from 1982. The first striked out sentence you can see was the entirety of the board policy. And now we've added the requested uh, um, or the suggested language from gamut and as well as our current practices. And I do have notes on, uh, on page A. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Noguchi earlier, page A, D, and 6 to add that research-based uh, language. And, wow. and then we'll, we'll also add that evidence-based. We'll make the, the language consistent across the three of them. Right. I just have a quick question. If, uh, in the naming of the BPs, could we outline certificate classified just because we have three that say the same, it's the same name, different. Yeah, BP. we could do that. Yeah, I, I just got a comment. How come we, we're um, <laughs> revising poor policies from 1982? I mean, man, it, it, was it in a bunker or something or part of some? Yeah, this, <laughs> this actually was found in the bunker. I'm just kidding. So uh, I think a, a lot of this has to do with, uh, you know, until recently there wasn't a curriculum development office. And so that, that line that was there was consistent. It, it, we are offering professional development. Now what we're saying is, hey, let's be real specific. Let's really outline the, how we're going to support our staff members to make sure we're building their capacity to help students you know, be the best learners they can. So uh, I agree, and uh, we're taking care of it. Because when I see the year, I get nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have one modification on this. Um, it, it says on, the, on page A, on the first bullet B, alignment of curriculum and instructional materials with Common Core state standards. Now, I really liked because state that Common Core could change, but on the previous one we had at the bottom of the page, um, on the very first page of BP 4131 that we just voted on, Number one at the bottom says mastery of subject matter knowledge, including current state and district academic standards. So I don't know if we could modify it. Just yeah, to that, that's a good catch. That we have been trying to strike out Common Core and just put state standards because yeah. that's what they are. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good catch. That's an error on our part. Okay, no worries. So I just thought I liked how it was stated on the current state and district academic standards, but I, if we could put that in there, I like that because that's where we're their academic standards. I, I, I want to just speak in behalf of. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you watching over us then? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Ninety-nine. Nineteen ninety-one. <laughs> All right, so with those proposed changes, 
Uh, do we have a motion to All of this approve yeah. board policy 4231 staff development for classified? I move approval. Motion by Trustee Mark, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Passes unanimously. We're going to move now to board policy 4331. So this is board policy 4331 staff development. Again, this is management. Uh, as, as stated before, prior to uh, in 1982, the first line was all that existed. We've now expanded that, expanded that to represent gamut suggested language as well as current practice. We will make sure we're consistent in language with the other two policies and recommendations you've made. We'll make sure that we go through this and, and make those consistent changes. All right. Any questions or comments? So we'll carry forward the previous uh, changes. And do we have a motion to? I apologize. I have a comment or a question, actually. Go ahead, um. Trustee Daly. So in the last two BPs, it talks about um, health, mental health, or in the classified, it's counseling. So, I, But it doesn't say anything about that that I can see in the management section, having knowledge of those things. So who qualifies as management? So management would be based on our bargaining groups, right? So certificated staff would be uh, anybody, you know, under that bargaining group. Classified would be under, so MTA, CSBA, and then management would be any classified or certificated management that um, fall under that group. So that would be principals? Correct. Vice principals, that would be an example of, and of a everybody management. everybody above them. Correct. So shouldn't there be that knowledge of health, mental health, and I like the wording in the classified section. Or in, or in the, sorry, in the cer certificated section where it says, Knowledge of topics related to students' mental and physical health and safety and welfare. So, Trustee Daly, which sec section were you just reading so from? So, we're back to 4131 in the certificated staff portion on page A, number 10. So I think that something along that line should be also in the management. There's, there's a portion in the classified section, but there's not a portion that I can see, at least, for that in the management section. That's certainly a bullet we can add there. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. And, and that would represent current practice as it is anyway, so we can do that. Can we just yeah. move that one there? I was going to say. Yeah. That's the whole, the whole point to... to the whole number 10 added to to the last to management yeah. and added just a number whatever 11. I would also like to ensure that the management uh, includes a cultural competency that would that trustee Mejia was re referencing in fact I think both of those need to go in all three board policies So that's uh, bullet four from 4131, page A. We'll, uh, we'll include that in the 4231 and 4331. Okay. And um, one last interjection question. So how do we, how do we measure what cultural competency, competency is? You know, what, what, is the, what is the guideline? What is the, the measuring um, tool to say, okay, they're culturally competent? You know, do we have some sort of, I'm not going to say test, but are some sort of yeah, it, practices? Filter. Huh? Uh, yeah. I, I think that that's really an ongoing process, right? As, as our community changes and evolves, that we would make sure that we would provide that in, in, a, in a similar way. I don't think there's ever a time where we can say, all right, I'm done, and then take this test and move on. But I think that's something that we'll about to we'll integrate, and as we currently do, throughout, um, you know, ongoing trainings. Right, because where I was getting at is, is that, that could be the dividing line between we're using competency when we're really awareness. So what's the dividing line? 
Just something to ponder. But something that I would say, I'm aware of the cultures of the Hispanic right. community, the African American, right. that's an entry level. Right. But I want to become competent. Right. And your competency is going to be different than your competency. And your entry level to that is going to be different over the years. And so it, we're always... we're we're always trying to work on where folks are at because if you push them too far, then they kick back. And so it's it's an o it's ongoing work, right? So I would push back on the awareness piece only because I think, yeah, I'm aware of it. That's great. And move on, right? But you need to be competent relative to um, uh, relative to the learning process, right? And the understanding of cultures and, and family life and lived experiences in order to be able to connect with that child and have that relationship to be able to um, move the learning agenda forward. So, right, and that's what I was I was getting at. And so, you know, so how do we maintain or get to that level within our district? You know, like you know, some places, you know, you can go out and get a, a cultural competency certificate nowadays, um, but you can't get one for awareness because, like I said, that's the entry level. You know, um, kind of. Yeah, I'm aware. Everybody exists around me. Um, versus, like you said, making those connections. Do people understand how to make those connections to our students? Our, you know, our, you know, everybody, um, you know, uh, amongst our staff, you know. So are we promoting that competency to, you know, throughout our staff members, or is it at certain levels? Or you know, teachers, counselors, you know, um, you know, those folks who have direct, you know, direct impact or um, connections to students. Well, and part of that, if you if you recall, so we have it in all three board policies that, that hopefully we land on. But if we think back to the point five competent, uh, the, the point five um, professional development that you guys have approved, point that point five is a point five of a percent of participation in a strict level of courses. Now we can define that those courses, either online or other is around cultural competency. So if they want to be able to participate and get a check for 0.5, a half a percent of their salary, then they participate in these six courses or three courses. I can't remember exactly what those hours are. And actually, that's what we have done over the last three years is um, we have focused it on cultural competency and really the work around um, Nancy Dome. This last year, we did open it up to in instruction, especially at the secondary level, where we really are focusing in on some key pieces that we need folks to um, engage in. But we certainly could go back, and that'll come through negotiations should it, should it land, that it's focused on just exactly what you're talking about. Now, can we force everyone to do that? No, but in our daily practice as managers, leaders, principals, we constantly engage in conversations that reinforce what you're talking about because you can take a class, but at the end of the day, it's situational. What's happened today in the decisions that you're making for that child today and why did you make that decision? That's more of a learning experience around culture than taking a class, but classes are good too. And that's probably more than you all needed to hear right now at 1125, but we absolutely are committed to working on it and it is at the head of the spear relative to the work that we need to do with this, this district. Right. So could it be something that we do as a district in terms of saying they take these six classes, you know, um, and we give them a certificate and based on our demographics in our district and we saying if you finish this and and you hear your country your it's like culturally competent, <laughs> but culturally competent, you know, within our district, you know, we feel that you're culturally competent, here's a certificate for that within MCS, you know, um, or something like that. I just, you know, and something that could probably be used as a as a, a measure of getting some extra pay or something down the line to go towards that or something like that. Certainly, I'm, certainly something that we can explore and we can talk about and bring back to the board to um, align to really what's going to be coming out of negotiations because, you know, everything's right. tied, to, tied to that and, and you ultimately... Uh, make the decisions on that. Right. So one other portion of that, it feels to me like with every uh, every course that's taught in our um, professional development, there's too many too many words and and uh, abbreviations we're using today. But in every professional development course, there could be just a brief cultural competency component. 
that comes in with the, the summary and the wrap-up and conclusion. Now, as we've learned this material, let's now review what we need to do to uh, make sure that we're culturally competent in how we address this in the classroom or whatever. You know, the thing I would add, and then I am going to turn it over, back over to Mr. Rich. This year, um, and it was highlighted in the mid-year review with special ed and EL, everything that we report out on or learn about has to be through the lens of EL and special, in special ed. So we don't call out cultural competence. We call, we, we speak to, let's say, this math, um, you know, sentence frames that we're using in the classroom for the purpose of, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's an alternative strategy in the classroom, but it also supports EL, but it also supports our English-only learners also. So we're doing it inadvertently because we're always pressing on EL and special ed. And, and I have to say that that is a new thing here in Modesto in the last five years. It's just recognizing that we have EL students in our class in every single class, and there's a lot of work still to do in this. And so the answer is yes, we're doing it, but we're not calling it that. We're we're bringing it down to the student level, and who are those students, and what are their experiences, and what are their barriers to to this lesson or to this unit or to these these grades? Great. All right. Well, let's come back. I want to make sure that we have uh, addressed the approval of the first reading. So we're we're summarizing bits and pieces that have now merged into all three of these uh, policies. So do we have a motion to approve the first reading of uh, Board Policy 4331 with revisions? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, let's move on to, let's see, what time do we want to try to take lunch? At, right at 12? I know that um, Antoinette just left. She just sent me a text saying that she left to go get it, so okay. half hour. Okay, let's judge that by when she returns. Good. Uh, so, Mr. Henderson, we may not be able to get clear through your stuff before we break for lunch. Are you going to be offended by that? No, but we can make it a goal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stretch goal. <laughs> okay, talk fast. Oh, um, they sound like they're locked out. Oh. All right. Uh, number 33, Board Policy 4100, Certificated Personnel. This is a new policy. So if all doors are locked and somebody from the public wanted to come in, would we that even know it? It's open. That door is open? Okay. <laughs> so uh, 4100, Mr. Henderson. Yes, good morning, uh, Board President Brown and trustees. And none of us would presume to even approach the standards set by Mr. Zerley earlier. Uh, in terms of his stretch, but uh, there is a little stretch of HR policies coming. The first one's Board Policy 4100. This is a new policy that recognizes the role that teachers and certificated staff serve in carrying out the district's educational goals. It ensures that we make clear the expectations for certificated service and hold staff accountable through regular evaluate, performance evaluation in accordance with law and our negotiated agreements. The policy further states the Board's strong encouragement for certificated staff to continually improve their skills and pursue excellence in the profession. It's recommended the board approve the first reading of this policy 4100. Great, uh, 4100 uh, board policy, any questions? Did we check with our, our units? I thought I should have asked this before, but our unions to see if they had any feedback on these, even though they are from CSBA doesn't mean that we wouldn't take some input on them. Yes, uh, there are several that I did. Uh, if there was anything I felt, you know, that, that may be of, uh, of a concern or just to give them a heads up. Yeah. This one's pretty straightforward, just I recognizing so. certificated personnel. You'll see other ones coming up where it talks about negotiations right. or the role they may play, and they did, did provide us some input. Okay, so you'll share that when we get there. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of Board Policy 4100 for certificated personnel? 
Trustee Daly and Trustee Marks uh, second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 And I believe I heard everybody, so passes unanimously. Uh, number 34, board policy and AR 4112.2. Uh, board policy and AR uh, regarding certification. Okay, yes, this is a mandated policy that addresses certification qualifications and requirements of certificated staff consistent with the Commission on Teacher Credentialing Guidelines. In all circumstances, the district exercises extensive efforts to hire fully qualified and credentialed certificated staff. However, due to a variety of reasons, there are occasions when fully certificated applicants are not available or suitable, and the district hires individuals who are in the process of becoming fully qualified uh, through completion of a credentialing program. The policy outlines the steps the district can take in priority order per the education code to hire not yet fully qualified credential uh, candidates and the notification requirements that the district has in certain situations to keep parents apprised of the credential status of their child's teacher. Uh, the policy also outlines the steps the district can take to promote uh, and incentivize certificated staff who may be interested in pursuing a national board certification uh, qualification. Uh, it's recommended the board approve the first reading of BP 4112.2 and as you referenced the uh, AR is also included for board reference only uh, and we'll add it to our regulations upon the approval of the BP. Right. Any questions regarding this uh, board policy <laughs> or the AR? I just have one question on ARB. It's a page B at the top. I'm for sorry, at the AR, you AR, said? AR, yes. We're on that, yes, 41.12.2. Okay. Um, it's right at the top, and it lined out as passed a basic skills proficiency test developed and administered by the district, by cooperating districts, or by the county. So this has to do with out of state, but it just says has completed beforehand, before this little section here at the bottom of the page, it says they've completed a basic skills proficiency test in another state, but then it doesn't say that they had a complete a test by our district for competency or proficiency. So I'm just wondering why we didn't do that and why that's lined up. Because I believe we should, other states have different standards than we have, and so it just seems like they should have to pass our proficiency test to be knowledgeable in the subject <laughs> area that we're asking them to teach our students in. Yes, that may have to do with uh, out-of-state credentialing, and anybody who comes to California would have to uh, align the requirements of their own credential and how it converts over to California credentialing. Um, so that would possibly be um, covered through that process. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at uh, the rationale if that was an optional piece for us to strike out based on um, something in, in our own process or through that alignment uh, with the commission. Do we have any yep. reciprocal, we do have reciprocal agreements, right, with some states? Not standing agreements, standing agreement. uh, okay. but uh, we look at what uh, requirements would be needed when they come from out of state and um, what may be transferable versus what they don't have. For example, some don't have necessarily the same EL authorizations that we require, so we would ensure that they, they get those. You know, I would add that if you if we're following the credentialing from the state, that we can't trumpet and say, now we need you to take an MCS basic skills test. If the state has given us the requirements to say this out-of-state teacher has the requirements, then that's a, a California requirement. It's not a Modesto City Schools requirement. But this is a CSBA suggested language, so they're saying that districts do have requirements for them to be competent in subject areas that the state may not have based on their language here that I see. So that's the only reason I'm asking that is because I wanted them competent in the areas that we need them competent in. Um, and so that's why I just was wondering why it was lined out. So, but. Yeah, it's usually the CBEST. Uh, oh, right, yes. CBEST. CBEST. CBEST yes. test, right. <laughs> Too many acronyms back to uh, Trustee Browns. <laughs> and, and previously on item six, it does say a person may demonstrate the basic skills proficiency in reading, writing, and math by 
passage of a basic skills examination in another state. Okay. Uh, so maybe it goes to your question, is ours more or less rigorous than what some other states may be? Right. Uh, and I would think with, uh, with that language that the basic skill level may be satisfied or allows that option to be satisfied through their passing of that if they come in with that. Okay. Uh, we, we can, we can okay. check and follow up. I just was, it just struck me as something I was curious as to why we wouldn't have our own test, but it's okay. If we don't, we don't. It's it because the next I'm, paragraph says, or the next statement says that the district shall develop a basic skills proficiency test, and that was lined out too, so I'm guessing we don't have that. So we're abiding by the state and what they ask County, and yes. not our own district. So as we look forward, maybe this is something we'd like to do in the future just to ensure that, let's say we hire a teacher for our English language learner students, and we want to ensure that they are also culturally competent in the areas that we want them to be. So we could have our own test to say, we want you proficient in this. And if they're not, at least then we know, and we can give them extra supports to help them become more proficient in that area, or at least become proficient in that area for our own students. But it's just a thought. So we don't have to change it now. Sure. I just was asking about but it. But I just know with all the tests and stuff, the teachers are <laughs> Have to take over, you know, just to become, just to become certificated now with the RECA, all that other stuff. I was like, I, that would be a turnoff <laughs> to me. You're gonna take me through all this rigorous stuff to get certified. Then I gotta come to a district, you know, and I'm just, you know, like me, I, you know, I teach in condensed, but I, I don't think I ever go back to teaching after all these tests that they gotta, <laughs> they gotta take and stuff and. You know, the little Rico, uh, I was just like, wow, that's what you got to do. When I was in, it was just the sea bass. I just and, like uh, the high standard. <laughs> I want a high standard for our students, high standard for our teachers, high standard for our management, high standard for our class. That's what so to our me, state does. That, I don't know. think they do it as well as we would because we know our own students. So that's why I'm, even yeah. though the state has their own way of doing things, I think we locally should be able to have that also. But, and it's fine if we, we're trusting the state to do that. I think that's okay. I just like our teachers to be more competent in some areas. <laughs> okay, I have a question regarding a, a further paragraph on that same okay. page B. The one, the short paragraph just ahead of short-term staff permit uh, addresses the same question. It says the district may charge <laughs> a fee to cover the cost of developing, administering, and grading district proficiency test. So, May charge if we did develop our own district level proficiency test. That means we would charge the the prospective not, teacher to take the test. Not that not that we would, but it allows the district discretion to do so if it needed to do so. I I would not think uh, currently we are waiving a number of the fees uh, just to facilitate selection and hiring uh, and remove some of the barriers. So this just folks, states so. that Ed Code would allow us to charge Correct. if we it chose may. to. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments about this section? No questions. Trustee Daly. Am I missing? Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to keep my head straight around this. The BP is the how. No, the BP is the what. The AR is the how. So in the what section, there's the parent notification. Am I missing the how portion? Or the AR? Yeah. Yes, it doesn't stipulate a paragraph or description of how we do the, the notification that is uh, pretty prescribed uh, in terms of uh, by the fourth week of school, uh, somebody who meets certain criteria and is not uh, credentialed or is in a pre-intern type of status, uh, we develop a letter of notification and send it out to the parents of those pupils. Um, so there's part of our federal program monitoring. Um, some language around how that's to be done, and it's not spelled out specifically in the AR. But you're not missing something, it is not there. <laughs> All right, are we prepared to uh, have a motion to approve board policy 4112.2, the first reading? Motion. I'll second. Okay, motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. And now we're going to number 35, 
Board Policy and AR 41.12.42, 42.12.42, and 43.12.42. And this is related to drug and alcohol testing for school bus drivers. And I would add the other commercial drivers as well as part of that. Uh, anybody who possesses a certain license and drives uh, under that, that license is subject to this. Uh, this policy outlines the drug and alcohol testing program and procedures for school bus drivers and other employees who have uh, that level of licensing as a condition of their position. Uh, while we already have a program and procedures in place, and this particular policy is not necessarily a among the mandated policies, it is uh, important enough that we felt that having it codified in policy is a good idea. Uh, the policy describes the rules against the use of drugs and alcohol by those who perform safe, safety sensitive functions and the conditions upon which they're subject to random and directed drug or alcohol testing. Uh, the corresponding AR is also included for the board's reference and will be added uh, to our regulations upon the approval of the BP. It is recommended that uh, the board approve the board policy. Okay, any question regarding this policy? Um, question. Um, as part of that, um, what, how many panels do we test for for our, our drivers? Uh, how many panels? Which yeah, so is, yeah. So it is uh, the the types. I think it's referenced in here the maybe in the administrative re re uh, regulation. Oh, the AR uh, marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, uh, PCP, and opioids uh, for that uh, as well as alcohol. Uh, but I don't know when they go to test how many specific uh, panels necessarily. But it does uh, cover both the drug and the alcohol that may influence or impair driving ability. Okay, so you don't know which panels of the drug that it, of the drugs that it, it takes, like, you know, like I said, um, marijuana, um, meth, cocaine, or, you know, there's a, hmm? Opioids. Opioids. Um, it is referenced those, on the AR, okay. yeah. In regards to marijuana, do we, um, I'm just trying to say this. Since marijuana is now now legal and they got some new legal guidelines around, if they uh, a driver has an accident, are they do they get sent for drug drug um, uh, drug screening after a, after an accident? Yes. Okay. And if they come back positive for marijuana, then what? Uh, they would be um, pulled as a safety sensitive function that they're performing if it met the level as there is a level for alcohol I uh, presume through the Department of Transportation a, a certain uh, threshold at which uh, if it impaired or was at a level of impairing but um, although medical marijuana and those types of things um, you know are, are uh, Increasingly um, uh, being uh, used, you still cannot use them while performing safety sensitive functions in your employment. Right. So that would be an area of, of concern. Because you can't, you know, like I said, say they use marijuana the night before they came to work, next day, then they get into an accident. And from, from you know, even my background, you know, it's like you can't. You can't terminate them, you know, because um, the law says, you know, they didn't do it. They didn't do it while working, so they have some rights now. So I'm just wondering, you know, how this going to affect us, you know, uh, as well. They got children. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. thing is, you know, they're driving children. So mm -hmm. with us, you know, we're delivering packages, you know, but they're still on the road, you know. Um, Yes, if any way their use uh, affected or impaired their ability under the hours of their employment, I think there's some description about the time periods right, that, so. that are included within that pre-driving uh, while you're on the clock. Uh, that would be something that we would um, take seriously uh, because, as you mentioned, the safety of students and those transporting our students is going to be the priority. And um, if, if any of that occurred that could impair and... Um, compromise that safety that we we would consult with legal counsel about the ability to um, take disciplinary action in those cases okay just wanted to... I, I want to piggyback a little bit more off of what John's uh, what trustee urban is saying 
my understanding is, is there is no way to under, to quantify the level, quant, 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 quantify, quantify, yeah, the level of, <laughs> I always get those two confused, the level of marijuana in somebody's system because technically it can stay in their system for 30 days. So is there a new test? Do we know? Because I, I, I agree, they're, they're transporting children. We need to know that information. For pre-employment, if there uh, were indicators of uh, marijuana in that drug test, uh, post-accident, if there were indicators of marijuana use uh, during that time and in a randomized um, drug test, which they are all subject to, being randomly pooled for drug testing, uh, the presence of marijuana would uh, trigger this, uh, this language. I think we need to be aware that this is a, an area of law that is constantly changing, and we've been told in uh, courses that I've been taking for employment law that uh, we just need to be aware that things will probably change within the next year. There should be some level of testing that uh, the state is working on, so it's a wait, watch, and see. On, on a great deal of this. Just one more, I just say that because I was told I had an employee who you know had an accident and did the drug screening, come back, it was positive for marijuana, but the attorney told me I couldn't, I couldn't terminate him. Mm -hmm. Based on that, based on that. So he basically said, how good this employee is, he might find something else to, to terminate him on instead of the, you know, the marijuana. I was like, what? It's like, yeah, the new law is, yeah, tricky. I don't know kind what license or class level license. Uh, they're regular. Um, so since they're under 10,000 pounds, so it's yeah. a regular class C driver's license. And that may be a difference when you're at a class C and. Um, yeah, I think one thing we, we have to remember is that as much like the airline, the FAA, the commercial driver's license for the vehicles we drive, our bus drivers, that's a federal they're under federal guidelines. Right. Um, and I have those, too. The federal teams. government yeah. operates mm -hmm. the guidelines, yeah. which, which is, in some cases, are dramatically different than right. the California or even employment law standards. So we have to make sure that we work closely with HR in the event of that happening to make sure, you know, uh, our employees are receiving the proper right. representation. But they are under, they are licensed under the federal guidelines, right. which marijuana, or DOT. As, as federal, is, you know, Ill illegal. illegal. Right, right, and I only have a few drivers that are um, under that, fall under that, because they drive the bigger, bigger trucks. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Um, so, board policy, forty-one twelve point four two, and that uh, is also forty-two twelve and forty-three twelve, all point four two. Do we have a motion to accept or to approve the first reading of the policies? So, motion by, I think I saw Trustee Lopez's hand first, mm -hmm. Trustee Mejia, and then second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Did I? Is it time for us to break for lunch? I think it's uh, an appropriate stop, stopping point. Come back in, in 30 minutes. Okay.
And we'll move on with uh, staying with Mr. Henderson and number 36 on AR uh, 4113 assignment. Yes, thank you. Um, this is assignment certificate of personnel. This uh, AR was first reviewed by the board and added uh, to the district's regulations in August of 2021. It outlines instances when, as uh, allowed by Ed Code, the district may assign a certificate and employee to a departmentalized course outside of their credential area and what conditions would allow that. At the time in 2021, we did not include the option to address uh, situations that may need to arise uh, to assign an elective course outside of an individual's credentialed area and the committee on assignments process through which an assignment can be determined. Uh, although it is allowed by Ed Code, we excluded it then because it was not a practice that we participated in. Since that time, we've determined that there are instances when this provision of assignments through a committee on assignment process would be helpful and in the district's best interest. Uh, by nature, the appointment through this process um, would occur on an infrequent basis. Uh, some situations might be like CTE uh, or PE assignments, for example. Um, so. We want to bring that back forward and add the committee on assignments process. This is uh, an AR. All right. Any comments or questions? <coughs> we do not need to take action on that. So seeing no comments or questions, we'll move on to number 37. Uh, so that's why it's just here for right. Yes. Oh. I got a. Oh, I had a question. Does this in, does this include um, eventually the new ethnic studies course? Depending on what's determined to be the credentials to teach that course, which I uh, imagine might be a little more open and flexible, similar to our health course or world geography religions, um, it could possibly arise that there's a situation in which. Somebody who we think would be great to teach it doesn't meet the criteria, and this would be a, a venue through which we could consider uh, additional individuals. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, on then to number 37, board policy and AR 4115.1, evaluation of certificated summer school employees. Yes, uh, to Trustee Mark's uh, comment earlier about consulting with our bargaining unit, this is one of those cases. Uh, the BP, this uh, was first adopted in 1981. There's the 80s again, allow a moment for nostalgia, uh, and revised in 2002, addressing evaluation during summer school. Uh, the change in the BP is just to allow designee to also complete evaluation. But the AR, the revisions brought forth, really were to look at that and simplify it to align it to our current evaluation process and practice. Uh, so it's recommended the board approve uh, BP 4115.2, and we'll add the AR with the approval of the BP. And yes, we did consult with our MTA partners on this one. All right, any questions or comments regarding that? <laughs> I know I've asked this before on different ones, but I noticed that the um, expectations for student achievement and assessment were kind of taken out. So I just, I liked seeing the student achievement in there because I believe that's the focus of what our education is all about is how they're doing. So I didn't know if, um, it just, it was number five that I noticed, other factors having a potential impact on student achievement, but to, I don't know if that can be in there as a, as a focus of, because that's what our goal is in summer school is student achievement so they can a lot of times make up for classes that they failed at during the school year and be able to get those credits back. So this is, I can't say that it's really saying that it's focused on student <laughs> achievement. Yeah, I think that? with summer school, the fluidity of it makes it a little bit hard to establish a specific goal around student achievement. Kids come in at all different places, uh, you know, and you're taking them from where they are to try and remediate. I might be in a class and students are, 
um, using that online curriculum to progress at their own uh, rate and level. But um, I, I think it's just uh, our summer school has changed over time, yeah. and um, it may it may not be uh, very very practical to try and make that happen during the summer summer school period. I, I think the important thing is we're just trying to emphasize if um, <clears throat> you're an established teacher and you're satisfactory and all other aspects of your your work uh, in the classroom in the district that we're going to apply that same evaluation uh, cycle to the summer school process, but also um, get in there and, and conduct a, an observation, uh, get some feedback on, you know, uh, what's happening in the classroom. But that was among those things, I think, um, in the, with the nature of summer school, we didn't, didn't think that that would be as productive in that uh, time period with a short amount of time to do that. Okay, That's and a, I, yeah, I, can mm -hmm. I get that. Yeah. Thank you. So summer school, to, to sound like the saying it's more enrichment, uh, educationally based enrichment. We have yeah, all of the above in terms of remediation, uh, enrichment opportunities, um, you name it, we offer it um, for to meet all different kinds of needs. Correct. Nine-hour program in our elementary schools, that includes both remediation and enrichment. And in the um, board reports that you guys typically see, we have made pretty good growth in terms of the academic progress of the children that are in summer school. Right. So that still wouldn't correlate to what... Trustee Marks was saying this mm -hmm. achievement if we're seeing those kinds of, that kind of progress or growth. Correct. We, we are seeing, we are seeing good growth. Mm -hmm. I think in the board reports, there's been credit attainment uh, reports that have been given by Mr. Lamelli. Yeah, and then there's also been progress on pre and post measurements that we give our kids in the K-6 in terms of their remedial program. Okay, I, I do appreciate that it does have the summer school evaluations will include one instructional goal for remedial classes, um, only for new employees. So I'm believing that there's more goals for uh, employees that have been in our district longer than that. So thank you. Just I don't, I just see a standard and go, wait, are we diminishing the standard? So thank you for that comment and understanding. All right, so we have... Uh... No other questions or comments regarding this uh, board policy? AR. <coughs> and the AR. So this is uh, board policy and AR 4115.1 right. evaluation of certificated summer school employees. Do we have a motion to approve the first reading? Trustee Lopez and second by Vice President Irvin. Uh, those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Carries unanimously. And uh, number 40 is a deletion. Uh, board policy 4131.39. Trying to move this agenda along. Sorry, guys. <laughs> 38. Uh, board policy and AR 4116 probationary permanent status. This is a new policy. Correct. Uh, this item codifies in policy the requirements, uh, ed code, uh, related to probationary and permanent status for certificated employees. Uh, as our practice regarding probe and permanent status and re-election or non-re-election have been consistent with the ed code, they also align with this policy. Uh, it's recommended the board approve BP 4116 and the AR is also included for reference only. Any Questions or comments from the board? <coughs> Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve board policy 4116 probationary permanent status? Motion by Vice President Irvin, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Carries unanimously. Um, now 39. Board policy 4216, probationary permanent status. Yeah, specifically as it relates to classified employees, this is a mandated policy that addresses pro probationary and permanent status uh, within the Ed Code for employees in the classified service. Uh, it's likely a mandate because a law changed in 2019 uh, with Assembly Bill 1353, which shortened the probationary period for classified employees from a year to now six months or 130 days of paid service. 
Uh, we've since negotiated the requirements into our contract language with CSCA to align with the law and this policy. As such, it reflects our current practice. <laughs> it's recommended the board approve PP 4216. All right. Any questions or comments regarding this policy? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve? This is approving the first reading of Board Policy 4216. Trustee Daly uh, with uh, Vice President Irvin, second. And those in favor? Aye. Aye. What's that? Jinx it. it. Take it home. Okay, motion carries unanimously. And now we're on number 40. <coughs> we get to do the deletion. Uh, board policy 4131.3, temporary and probationary teacher assistance. Yes, this is another that we consulted with our uh, labor partners about, uh, MTA. <clears throat> this uh, board policy last revised by the board in 1986 addresses how the district will support its temporary and probationary teachers. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, limited in scope and lacks detail. In October of 22, the board approved board policy 4131.1, teacher support and guidance. And its uh, companion AR was added to the district's regulations. That policy and the AR <clears throat> are more current and, and much more comprehensively address the level of support the district provides to its new teachers. As such, uh, this policy today is considered obsolete and we're recommending its removal. It's recommended the board approve the first reading of the deletion of BP 4131.3. All right. Any questions? Motion by uh, Trustee Mejia to delete board <coughs> policy 4131.3. Do I have a second? I second. Second by Trustee Marks. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Motion carries. And next we have an item 41, board policy 4136, 4236, and 4336 for non-school employment. Thank you. Uh, this policy defines the conditions upon which employees who are involved in activities for compensation that are unrelated to their district employment can do so in a manner that is compliant with the government code. Uh, the district's interest is for its employees to prioritize their district employment as service to students and the educational program. In cases in which the district employees are engaged in other employment in addition to their district service, the policy defines conditions for which such additional employment and compensable activities would be appropriate. Uh, in the next item, we'll be recommending deletion of an existing policy uh, that this would replace uh, we've incorporated some of the brief sections of, of that policy into this more comprehensive one to assure alignment specifically uh, with regard to the provision of services by employees to students for a fee. Uh, it's recommended the board approve the first reading of BP 4142-4336. All right, any questions? Trustee Marks. So didn't we have... <clears throat> Didn't we have one that's very similar to this not very long ago that we, that tells that our uh, teachers or, well, I mean, staff cannot get outside employment? It seems like we had an issue before, and I thought that's where we came, we had a board policy on that. I don't recall recently. We did, we you do too. have one on the books, which okay. we'll be recommending deletion with the addition of this one, okay. um, but I, I don't recall a specific... It may have been embedded into a different policy in some respect oh, uh, on a yeah. different uh, related topic. That's what I think it was. I think it was on, I, because when we did it, we, your items, we had a lot <laughs> like two years ago. Uh -huh. And so maybe it was embedded in that. But I remember reading something very similar about outside employment and the, it had, it had even more items on what the restrictions were and exactly what they could and couldn't do. So maybe that was on, so it had to do with employment. So, okay, I, I, it's okay. I, I just, this yeah. was more or another board policy on the same thing. I can say there's a couple in the business services area oh, uh, that, that do, they, they seem to be uh, closely related. 
Um, this one, may, maybe that one doesn't touch <laughs> specifically on services where this one does. So they are aligned, but there is some similarity because of the impact such would have on business services. Right. Yeah, to me it was, it had to do with being self-employed also in another work environment and then um, using maybe their same time with the school district at some point, and so it was an issue. Ooh, our screens went dark. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's all right. I just I just sort of recalled it, so no worries. I do have a question. Uh, on the first page, uh, number four, it uh, precludes someone having work uh, that would be under the direction of... Uh, another district employee or board member. So what that tells me is that uh, we as board members could not hire district employees to do work for us outside of their own time. And uh, also that uh, employees could not work for each other. So I'm, I'm wondering, I recall back when uh, my dad was a teacher, uh, summers he worked for another teacher in his district who was a, had a general contractor's license, and my dad worked under that uh, contractor's <laughs> license. Would something like that be not allowed under this uh, policy? It is a little difficult to interpret situations and how they would apply here. That's taken directly from the government code. Mm -hmm. uh, in specific <laughs> scenarios, there have been a couple in, in the recent <laughs> past uh, that we've, we've had to consult legal counsel about, and it's within the uh, the definition of um, inconsistent, incompatible, and inimical, uh, but I can't think of a specific circumstance which would meet uh, item four, um, but possibly that example that you're, you're giving. Um, most often it's um, you take a counselor who wants to uh, provide counseling services to a family who uh, can tell them the best things they can do to, you know, be among the highly considered at a, at a university or something, and they want to charge privately for that service. Um, it's dealing with those types of situations, uh, but I can't um, say if that indeed, what you mentioned is, is specific to item four, it sounds like it. Yeah. I... <laughs> so I, I'm just curious if that uh, would keep people from working together in the same industry outside of work time. But it's subject to the, it, it, it has to be approved. Each request can come to the Associate Superintendent of Human Resources or designee, and, um, and they can describe their specific uh, duties and if they're okay within the district and determine whether to grant the authorization for such employees. So the district has the ability, or your office or designee, has the ability to deny or accept that opportunity. Like you said, it can be a unique circumstance, and you can evaluate that. But it does, it is incumbent upon the employee to ensure that they communicate, because it says they have to come to the district and say, I want to do this. Will you allow me to do this? Here's the round, here's the, parameters around my employment opportunity, may I do that? I'm a counselor, I'd like to do it for the summer for blah, 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 another district or someone else, and then see if that's a, appropriate or amiable to them. But it sounds like your office has the opportunity and it, it may, you know, that gives an option for them. It doesn't say no, you can't do this. It just says if you choose to do this, then you have to go through the district and let the district know you're, because, and it prevents employees from, using their own district resources uh, in a way that we feel would not be beneficial to our students. It might be harmful because let's say they started a program in the summer that we're already doing throughout the year, but the students decide they want to stay with them following the summer. So that, te that teacher or counselor could say, I want to keep the students, and then they're no longer in our program. So that would be non-beneficial to what we're doing with our students. So that would be harmful. So if the district said, no, you can't do that, that's just an example that I came up with, then the district could say, no, this is violating it, and here's the policy, and here's the deal. So you can't do it beyond the summer. Correct. We would evaluate it to see if there, there is a nexus of some conflict of interest of some kind, and either 
either approve or, or not. Um, another situation was a, a district employee who was involved in another activity with a, a private school. And the question was whether or not the access to uh, our students and student information would somehow be used to recruit students away from the district into the private school setting, those types of, of things. Um, and so evaluating based on individual circumstances of those situations. Right. Does that answer? Yes, it does. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> so uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 4136, 4236, and 4336? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Third's done. <laughs> Moving. Okay. Item number 42. Uh, another deletion. It's board policy 4136.1. Consulting certificated personnel render. Uh, rendering services for a fee. And as we just mentioned with that last policy, we made sure to incorporate language from this one, which dealt specifically more with professional services, getting to that kind of counseling element uh, into the previous board policies. So in so doing, uh, that makes this one obsolete. We did consult with our labor partners on that, and uh, we recommend deleting, uh, approving the first reading of deletion of BP 4136.1. So a motion to, for deletion of uh, 4136.1 by Trustee Mejia, second by Vice President Irvin. And uh, as we vote on these, they don't need to come back for a second vote, uh, do they? Okay. So those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, carries uh, unanimously. 43. Uh, board policy 4140, 4240, and 4340 uh, bargaining units. This is a new policy. Correct. This policy, consistent with government code, addresses the rights regarding the formation of bargaining units and their role in serving as the exclusive representatives of their respective employee groups. Uh, management employees are exempt and, as the policy states, are not permitted to be exclusively represented by a formal bargaining unit. Uh, consistent with the government code and our practice, the district does not get involved in encouraging or discouraging membership in employee organizations. With respect to the representative access to employee orientations, we have uh, established MOUs um, with both units uh, that explicitly lay out their access to new membership, uh, employee orientations, as well as periodic lists of members uh, on a uh, prescribed basis that we send to them and, and communicate on a regular basis. That was part of a Assembly Bill 119 several years ago. Uh, we work closely with our labor partners on issues related to access and information and have open lines of communication to resolve any concerns that arise. Um, with that, it's recommended the board, board approve the first reading of BP 41, 40, 42, 40, and 43, 40. Excellent. Any questions or comments? Trustee Marks? So on this, um, I just uh, had some concerns or just wanted to ask on number B of this policy. Uh, the first paragraph that's lined out, um, it says the superintendent or designee may communicate with district employees regarding their rights under the law. Such communication shall be factual and accurate and may not promise a benefit, threaten, pay reprisal, in, or in any way deter or discourage employees from joining an employee <laughs> organization or paying dues. I appreciated the fact that it says it will be factual information. It's going to be distributed. I, um, I mean, we already obviously have a union, but I would also like, because I can't remember, were you, we did this at one point, and I thought it was extremely helpful to be able to be allowed to put out important factual information to our bargaining unit based on our perspective and or the district's perspective. So I would like to continue on with that. I, I was concerned that this is eliminating our opportunity to be able to uh, the superintendent's office or designee being able to communicate with the district employees because 
it just seemed right. Now the next paragraph says, however, so it's going to change all that and add some uh, other context to it. But I would like to keep that paragraph. So I think uh, uh, what you might be referring to, and you correct yes. me if I'm wrong, is during our negotiations process um, a couple years ago, there was a question about um, giving out updates and putting them in the in the, communicating out the status of negotiations and what we were offering and factual information about negotiations. Uh, we had approached uh, one of our units about putting out a joint communication. They opted not to do that. Right. So I don't know if you're re referring to that. I think specifically what this is referring to is if the district wanted to put out information about employees' rights to or, or their option not to join a union. Right. That's what I thought it was. It has to do their rights to join or not join a union. Mm -hmm. I believed that that was the intent of that law was to allow for that. And so this to me is deleting that opportunity by the district to be able to put that out there because I don't believe, I remember this whole thing because I was very active in CSBA when all of this, we were in these negotiations about that and asking the to change that, uh, make amendments to that law before it passed. It was, and the law, we did get those amendments in. The amendments allowed for us to be able to communicate the, this information to our employees to allow them to choose. Not all employees know there's an option to choose, and I thought that was an extremely com uh, valuable component to that uh, for, our, for our staff to be able to know that. So I would like, that's why I would like to keep this. I know that, and I appreciate the new way we're bargaining. That's way different than what we used to do because we are putting the information out and everybody has access to that. Where before, it was all behind closed doors. The union could say whatever they wanted about what we were offering, but we could never tell them what we were offering because it was, it was secret. But now it's not. So I appreciate that, that we did completely change that, that process. But to me, this is about joining or not joining a bargaining unit. Mm -hmm. And so I would like our employees to be able to have the opportunity to understand what the law says, the rights of that law. So I just wanted to keep that one paragraph. Yeah, just a couple more um, thoughts uh, as, I, as I'm hearing you. Um, uh, post Janus decision, I think right. that was a particularly sensitive <laughs> issue. We were very delicate about how we communicated about the Janus decision and to, to employees or not. We tried to stay very much uh, out of it other than, if asked, providing factual information. I think yes. the government code allows us to have uh, that communication uh, as needed. Um, given our, our very collaborative relationships with mm -hmm. our labor partners, I think the concern was we didn't want to signal to them uh, an intent mm -hmm. uh, that, that that's what we plan on, and, and thus I think the, uh, the deletion. But uh, as part of a government code, we certainly could keep it in if that's the board's desire. So I would just like to keep it in so that it stays there. I know there can be changes at any time in our district with people and how things are run. And so if we take it out, then it's much harder to put it back in. So I'd rather keep it. And right now it's not a problem. So why? I mean, yeah, let's just keep it. And it's, But in the future, if we need to rely on it, then we have an option in that situation, which if we went into really difficult times, it may be needed. And right now, I, you know, that's why I just want to keep it so we keep our options open and not shut the door. But if we, if we do put it back in, do we need to run it past the bargaining units again? Just so no, we didn't it? consult specifically on that, that item. Uh, I, I think they would, well, I don't want to yeah. speak for them, but it's a matter of government code. So sure. if that's what the board desires, we can keep it in there. It's item B, it's page B, it's the the first paragraph that says the superintendent or designee. Oh, yeah. okay. So just adding that paragraph in, not the second one, because um, that one just sounds like it's going to be a problem. <laughs> so the other questions, Trustee Daly. I agree with Cindy and and I'm sorry, Trustee Marks in regards to keeping it in. I've worked with several teachers over the course of the last <laughs> seven years, and some of them do not know that they don't have to be part of the union. Just giving options for mm -hmm. teachers if they choose. So. Okay, I've got one other question, and that is on a strikeout on the first page. Uh, it says, we've stricken out, employees mm -hmm. shall not be prohibited from wearing union buttons or other items that favor or oppose the formation of a bargaining unit or any matter that is subject to negotiation. So does that mean that they are no longer allowed to wear? 
No, it means uh, when consulting with our legal counsel, uh, that's a very nuanced topic uh, and one that is very situational and would involve what, what impact and under what circumstances and context uh, the wearing is occurring and um, uh, on advice that uh, given that that's so contextual, uh, maybe just not a stock statement out there uh, would be sufficient. If, uh, if the wearing caused a certain level of disruption, then um, there could be circumstances when we would make a determination that it's it's going to be prohibited. So not wanting to get into that kind of sensitive area, we thought it best to uh, to strike that out at this time. I have a comment because this did happen in our district. I don't know if you remember where they wore the T-shirts to school. They came here with their T-shirts on, but they wore them for like two or three weeks at school causing this mass disruption and it was, everybody was asking. Neon green. Yeah, they were like neon green oh. and, and it's, it's, I don't know. Anyway, they were very um, <laughs> opposed to stuff that the district was so, working on. But doing. that's that's different than what is in right. this paragraph. This is a, right. specific to whether or not to join a union. But it says, or any matter that is the subject of negotiations. And at that okay. time, we were in the middle of negotiations, right. and You're they right. were promoting their viewpoint through their T-shirts. <laughs> but we're, we're not saying in policy that they can't do that. Yeah, you are. I would. We are. Or are we? No, we're saying they can still wear the T-shirts. They can do whatever they want with buttons. They can do it as long as, as, long as it doesn't cause a disruption. Yeah, I think... I mean, if we look at our country in the First Amendment, we should be able to do that. Right. Right? I don't think we can tell. Now, if it's disruptive to the learning environment, that's a different story. But to come out and say, no, you can't, that's not who we are as a country or as a, as a, um, as a district. Now, it's very different if it's causing harm to themselves or others or the learning environment. And then it goes to you know, legal counsel, and we can, we can use other statutes and other board policies to stop disruption. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say that I, I don't think that wearing or displaying is the bad thing, right? And if there is disruption or if there's, you know, altercations or whatever it may cost in at uh, school, right, or wherever, that needs to be addressed, but not the physical of like I'm gonna wear my support for such and such, right? As long as it follows safety precautions within are normal, normal standards, right, of course. So what, what we're saying then is that we're not going to suggest that it's not legal for them to do it, or we're just not going to include any language about that in our policy. Correct. It's not the intent to censure anyone or to limit their First Amendment rights, as Trustee Daly mentioned. Um, we, we don't want to put others... Uh, <coughs> Uh, others post uh, post Janus, you know, who may may not be in a position of, of wanting to be a part of a unit, feel any kind of undue pressure. Um, so th there's just it's delicate, and um, we thought a just a universal statement like that uh, really remove the contextual circumstantial factors that may inform a decision about whether that's in fact true. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other comments? Let's... Members are right. Okay. I have a... Oh, hello? Yeah. So I was just going to say, so so are we saying that we want to keep this in? Or where can we find this? Huh? Take it out. No, but I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned it because I, I, if I'm... Reading this correctly, uh, President Brown mentioned, you know, we're deleting this or are we prohibiting it? So if we're not prohibiting it, should we keep it in? We're, we're not prohibiting it, but we're just not calling it out as it's not a required, not required content. We haven't restricted anyone from wearing buttons or <laughs> T-shirts that state their uh, whatever their opinion is right. as a union member. So 
But yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So if it's not going to be here, that's perfectly fine. But if we're saying that it's not prohibited, where does it state that? Somewhere. Right, but this is saying employees should not prohibit it from wearing it. So, but by stricken that, we're saying there is that there is that gray area where someone could be prohibited. So if it's not being said here, where is it being said that no one should, uh, employees should not prohibit, uh, be prohibited from wearing uh, union buttons or other items? I, I, I guess I read that and in my mind add under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. So employees should not be prohibited under any circumstances from wearing da da da. And that's where I get into uh, the possibility that there may be circumstances depending on the situation or how they're being used that it, it could be um, but that that definitely would involve our our legal counsel and established case law and and decisions and uh, so we just didn't we we didn't necessarily feel comfortable making an emphatic statement that across the board under any circumstances there wouldn't be a, a, a need to prohibit but um, I mean it's a great discussion Are you comfortable with that? <laughs> Quite sure, because I don't know. If, so that's what I'm saying. So like uh, what I'm saying is it says on here, employees shall not be prohibited from wearing union buttons. Let's just leave it to that point. So we're stri uh, striking that out. Um, you say it doesn't probably doesn't fit or doesn't go on here. We don't want to highlight it. But where um, where would we where would that somewhere be appropriate to highlight? Hey, you know, we. We shall not prohibit union members from wearing buttons and, and such on and so forth. So I, I, I believe that by stricking it out, you're leaving that discretion of there might be points uh, where it's okay to prohibit it. But if there is okay to uh, uh, moments where it should be prohibited, that should be outlined. Like we shall not uh, prohibit unless there is A, B, C it out and leaving it up to a complete gray area, I believe that if there is moments where it, it needs to be prohibited, that it's outlined, whether it's here or where, the, where it's in the AR, and that's what I was asking. So if it's not here, where is it? Well, wouldn't that be anything? Anything that they're wearing could be prohibited. And so is there, is there a a rule somewhere in regards to a policy in regards to dress code or something along that lines, then that may be where it would be. We don't have an employee dress code no. uh, to answer yeah. the, the simple uh, basic question on that. Uh, I, I get your point, um, Trustee Lopez. I understand that. What, what we're not doing is suggesting strike that out and also put language in that says employees shall be prohibited. We're not we're not going that route. But I think um, what you're saying in terms of it, it would be prohibited if A, B, and C, uh, I was trying to allude to it's, it's kind of very situational depending on the circumstances and, and um, a very nuanced. But um, what, what I can do is take this uh, uh, under advisement and um, see if there is language that our legal, legal counsel would advise to give them the structure that you're talking about or get more information about it? So uh, my concern would be that there may be a feeling of bullying on the part of uh, employees that don't want to participate in the union if the if everybody else is wearing a, a badge that says uh, join the union. <laughs> uh, so I'm... I'm not feeling like we need to, to suggest that it's okay to wear with them. So I don't know. Um, I, I would, I, I think it would be wise if we took that under advisement and see if there is some language that uh, would be appropriate. Yeah, because I think what we're getting, what we're, talk, what we're really fundamentally talking about is First Amendment. And it's yeah. really going to be situational to the school and the time and the people and uh, the context. And I don't know that we could, 
A, B, C, D it to, you know, I don't, that I don't know, but it would be good. Let's, let's bring this one back. Let's talk to Roman and, and see what we can do. We hear, we, we hear what you're saying, um, but we also recognize we're, we're, we're dealing with First Amendment rights. Yeah. So. Okay. okay. So uh, with that uh, item being taken under advisement, are we okay to approve <laughs> the first reading? Um, I think we should table this one and come back. Okay, let's bring it back. Sorry. No, okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's a good, good conversation. I appreciate the in input. Okay, so uh, number 43 has been tabled. We'll move on to number 44, which is board policy 4143 and 4243. Negotiations and consultation. This is a new policy. Yes, this policy outlines the board and district's responsibilities with respect to collective bargaining process and the underlying balance we attempt to maintain between meeting the needs of staff and the district priorities and providing a high quality instructional program based on a sound, realistic budget. Consistent with government code, the policy describes our obligation to negotiate in good faith uh, on matters within the scope of representation provide release time as needed uh, to monitor progress and keep the public informed of the status of labor relations and to ensure the financial impact of any negotiated agreements are consistent with the district's Good. goals with respect to its financial certifications. Uh, it's recommended that the board approve the first reading of BP 4143-4243. Any questions or comments regarding this board policy? And are these board policies? Being none, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 4143-4243? Motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. 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 That one carries unanimously. Number 45, board policy and AR 4143.1, 42. 43.1, public notice, personnel negotiations. Yes, this is an update to a policy that we have had on record. It was last revised in 1991. The policy addresses process and procedural matters related to the district's negotiations with its labor partners. Our practices have been consistent with the policy. The version considered today incorporates more current language from Gamut. It's recommended the board approve the first reading of BP 4143.1 and 42.43.1. The corresponding ARs included for reference uh, will be added to our regula regulations with the approval of uh, the policy. Right. Any questions or comments regarding these uh, two items? 41.43.1 and 42.43.1. Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to approve the First reading of board policies 4143.1 and 4243.1. Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Next is uh, item 46, board policy and AR uh, 0430, comprehensive local plan for special education. That's Mr. Herp. Yes, uh, BP and AR 0430 includes information on the comprehensive local plan for special education. This BP is primarily cleanup language based on changes in state requirements and acknowledges that the California Department of Education now considers Modesto City Schools a multi-district SELPA based on the two separate districts. It's recommended that the board approve BP 0430. Any questions uh, or comments regarding this uh, policy? I did have one quick question. In the very first paragraph that uh, we've stricken out includes children who have been suspended or expelled. So 
are they addressed someplace else? Yeah, that, it, they still reside within our jurisdictional boundaries, so therefore we have an obligation to serve them. For some reason, that just called out that group. Because they reside in our jurisdictional boundaries, we are required to serve them. It's, it's, it's repetitive in, in nature. That's so there's no part of need to yeah. even identify it? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a motion to approve uh, board policy... Uh, 0430, Comprehensive Local Plan for Special Education. Trustee Mejia and a second by Trustee Marks. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Then we move on to item 47. Or are we on 46? 47. Okay. Policy and AR 0450 Comprehensive Safety Plan. Yeah, BP 0450 includes information on the comprehensive safety plans. This again is basically cleanup language. There is one addition, a little additional information. Um, it stays consistent with our practices. It's recommended that the board approve BP 0450. All right, any questions regarding this board policy? So do we have a motion to approve board policy 3515, campus security? My apologies, uh, for I have the a first question. Reading. Sorry. Um, I, I'm just curious, due to things that have happened in other situations, who is responsible if there is an emergency and emergency teams have to be on site? Who's the lead as to what's going on? Site principal in terms of the lead at the site, and then it's a combination of uh, the senior director of child welfare and attendance, David Howe, Brad Godot, and myself. Okay. And executive director of the school. Thank you for pointing that out too, Dr. Ryan. Okay, and so you then would work in conjunction with emergency services? Correct. In any way, but they would take direction from you? Mm -mm. Uh, emergency you services, depending on the event, they usually are the what they are the point people. Okay, so I'm just gonna call it out. What are we gonna do if something like Texas happens? And We would work hand in hand with emergency personnel, including Modesto Police Department or County Sheriff's Office. We know how they handled that, though. They didn't really handle it all that great. So is there somebody else above them that could that we know so, that we so I think this um, I think this topic is much larger than than yeah. this afternoon so um, we we did have um, a special board meeting on safety protocols we can bring that back in the coming um, board meetings as far as where we've gone since October when we had that safe that that first board presentation and we can outline that for you it may just be like if you guys don't need it it may just be me that needs it so that's There's something that could be that. updated in a Board communication. Yeah, we could we could update in board communication. What we're talking about is multifaceted. We're talking about a fire. We're talking about an active shooter. We're talking about an earthquake. We're talking about multi site casualties due to gas leak and explosion. I mean, there, there, it it runs the gamut, and each one of those have different protocols. But we do have protocols for that, and we work very closely with um, emergency services. Um, and we also, as as we talked about in our special board meeting in October. We have added on another layer this year, and that is Raptor and also Knowledge Saves Lives. And that actually, that report is going to be coming to the board in June. Um, outside vendor looking at our safety protocols with recommendations, and, and also then the next level of that will be training. And so we'll bring that back. I think it's scheduled the second board meeting in June, um, but we'll be bringing that back. And, and that'll be a perfect opportunity to ask questions to the extent that we can answer it because there's some things we flat out don't want to answer in public um, just because of um, just certain protocols right, that, yeah. that we want to be able to keep keep closer to um, uh, out of the public's view yes, if you will you and but that would be a great time to be able to ask that we'll make sure that we leave time because you need to know how how that responds mm -hmm. And you could go in the meantime and watch the board meeting in October if you could let her know which one had it. Might be an hour to watch that presentation because we had a lot of questions too when we were doing that. But just to re reiterate what uh, Superintendent Noguchi said is that 
our district works really well with our law enforcement and we have plans set in place for if this happens then this is what we do but we also don't want to disclose all of the information and how we work with them and what we do because then the enemy could have that information as well so we just want to make sure that we are ahead of whatever could happen and the fact that we're putting fences on our schools I think is helping making single entry all of that is really helpful and our staff has worked really hard at the safety, and I appreciate getting all these updates whenever anything happens with a student on our campus that they brought something they shouldn't have brought to school, uh, you know, to know what's going on. But then also know law enforcement is there like right then. And it's different than it used to be. We used to have a, um, a police department on our campuses, but we have our own security, but they're in connection with the, fire de with the police department too. So I just appreciate the fact that our district's really been working hard to ensure our students are safe. But it's good to know some more details so you can ensure the public knows, hey, we're doing this, so you don't need to worry. And that's a big deal because whenever anything happens, that's the number one thing parents think about. <gasps> What's happening at my kid's school? So that's good. Well, unfortunately, you know, a classic example of a great response was just recently, unfortunately, yeah. in Memphis, how that was handled and how the school and the emergency personnel and um, police work together to defuse the situation um, quickly, even though there were six who perished. It, it could have been a whole lot more had that communication and that, that, um, that team effort between agencies, which is difficult to do in itself, you know, even in non-emergency times. But um, that's a classic example. And Trustee Daly, every situation that arises is going to bring up new uh, situations that we should consider and so this has to be a hot topic for us at all times the public will be watching what's happening out everywhere else and holding us accountable for what happened there so uh, appreciate your your focus on that um, so board policy 3515 campus security do we have a motion to approve the First reading. That one was, oh. that one was comprehensive oh. safety plans, the one before. Okay, where are we? <laughs> We're on BP0450. Okay, comprehensive safety plan. Uh, I move approval. That's uh, board policy 0450. Yes. And motion by Trustee Marks, second by Trustee Daly. Thank you. And now we move on to 48. Campus security board policy and AR 3515. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those in favor. <laughs> Thank you. My eyes are getting blurry and my brain is doing the same. <laughs> okay. 48. Board policy and AR 3515. All right, BP and AR 3515 includes updated information on campus security. The updated policy includes language on reporting school threats and provides additional information on the district's desire to provide a school environment that promotes safety for our students, staff, visitors, community, et cetera. It's recommended that the board approve BP 3515. Any questions regarding board policy 3515? So I have two comments for um, Trustee Maestas. The first is on page 3515A, where it says in the second paragraph that is read, additionally, anyone who receives or learns of a health or safety threat related to school or school activities is encouraged to report the threat to school and district administration. He wanted to have a little stronger language than encouraged. Um, I did talk to uh, Mr. Herbst yesterday, and do you have it? No, actually, that works. I reread it again last night. I think that that would be appropriate. Okay. What would the, what would you recommend? I, I would be fine with his required uh, school activity. It is actually after a reread, I was worried that it was more or less somebody from the public or something like that. But the, as I read the section, I believe it's talking about in general still our personnel. So therefore, if somebody became aware of a health or safety concern, I would say that they would be required to report that. He's required to report. So that's stronger. And then the anyone. Are we talking about employees? I believe we are based on as you read the section. So do we need to say additionally any employee? No. 
Because to me, anyone means everyone, including students. Yeah, I would say anyone, a student, any student, staff, if you, if you know of a health or safety threat, you're required to let the principal know or you're required to, to report that. Because all we've learned, when you all work together, we minimize risk, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the required on there. I am. Okay, I'm I'm fine with that. I just want to clarify who anyone. Can we was. put will or shall. You want required to. My concern is that. Well, anyway, I just I was thinking of students who do non-real threats who want to just disrupt the school, and so now you're required to. You you have to look into it, but if they're required to do it, then immediately everything has to shut down, is my guess. But if right. that's what we want, that's okay. I'm just asking. Well, we don't know what the threat is. There's some right. things yeah. you close down true. for, and there's some things, you, the majority of the things you don't close down for. Yeah. Required to report doesn't say required to shut yeah, down. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so yeah. Okay, required. And then one, two, three, the fourth paragraph, there's the word stakeholder, and we need educational partner. Okay. And then that's it. Okay, so uh, with those uh, recommended changes, do we have a motion to I just, approve? I have a question on the difference between stakeholders and education partners. Aren't stakeholders anybody in the community? Aren't education partners someone who already has a partnership with us? So this was brought up last year by our student board rep to the um, board, state board, right. and just the word stakeholder for the um, mm -hmm. opposition from our indigenous partners. They were they they voted at the state board to take stake the word stakeholder out okay. and just um, uh, substitute educational partner. So it's just not using the word stakeholder. Okay, what if we used? I, just because when we say education partner, that seems like it limits it only to education and not community partners. But maybe it's just how I'm reading it. I'm just wondering if that, because to me, community partners is a broader definition than education partners. Because education partners to me are Stanco, the other elementary districts, the high school, you know. But maybe I'm just looking yeah. at it differently. No, I think education partners are everybody. everybody. And I think that was the conversation at the state board when they okay. voted to stop using stakeholders and, and put education partners. Education partners was just a wide breath um, of, I mean, everyone is, everyone's in service of educating our kids, right? From okay. the neighbor to the... Okay, if that's how it's interpreted. Parents. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. I just wanted to yes. ensure that it was broader. Okay, that's fine. And I actually can get the definition from the state board on stakeholders, and I'll, I'll send that out to you guys so you can see... Because if that's what we're using now, educational partners in lieu of stakeholders, right. then we need to have an understanding of what that is and what their thoughts were when they made that determination that they no longer were going to use that word. And so, but it has but to. Obviously, there's more buy-in when you say. Uh, I'm a, uh, right. Yeah. More of a partner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. And that you know, makes sense. Of, uh, yep. okay. I hear it that way. Mm -hmm. All right. So given those changes, uh, do we have a motion to approve this uh, board policy? 3515, Campus Security. I second. Motion by... Lopez, <laughs> and a second by Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. 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 I remember to vote. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Number 49, board policy and AR 5112.3, student leave of absence. Yeah, this is new, uh, new language. BP and AR 5112.3 recognizes that there may be situations that a student participates in opportunities outside of school to contribute to the student's educational experience. The proposed language is new and recommended by the California School Boards Association. It's recommended the board approve BP 5112.3. Any questions on 5112.3? What's going to determine 
So it may be beneficial for the student to participate in opportunities outside the school which contribute to their educational experience. What determines that? A parent request that would then basically, if you go down to the AR, it talks about who would review that request to determine if it would be educational in nature. And if we would grant such a leave, they would still be uh, required to return uh, uh, and, and still participate in the academic requirements, either through independent study or another medium. And question regarding the, the time frame. Is oh, this anywhere it. from... What's the, what's the minimum? Does not have a minimum, but it does say the student shall be permitted, uh, permitted to return. Look at the AR on the last page, 5112.3A. Students shall be permitted to return to school at any time and shall not be prevented from completing their academic requirements within a time period equal to that of their classmates. And if a student re-enrolls at a time other than the beginning of the semester, the, uh, the school shall not be required to provide makeup sessions for the classes missed. Okay, so this is not like taking a year off of sabbatical. No, it actually <laughs> says in the paragraph before it, it says the length of the leave may be yeah. up to one semester or up to two semesters for a continu uh, continuation education student. It's actually on 5112.3, the last paragraph. See, have we ever been in a situation where we've done a leave of absence? Yeah, there's, it's, it's happened on occasion before. When a student, I'm trying to think of an example to where they would leave on an educational uh, uh, trip or no, I don't recall a situation off the top of my head. Typically, we would place the student on long-term independent study, but it would probably need to be a situation in which long-term independent study isn't really feasible or desired during that period of time, given the nature of the activity that they would be leaving for. Um, I don't have any concerns. It's a I mean, this would be a very, very, very small number of, yeah. of things so that I would think. And, and it has to be evaluated and approved at a very high level. Um, so it's it, just leaving us open for the unique opportunity it, as it arises. It provides Correct. flexibility for students is how I would interpret that. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, approve the first reading of this policy? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Daly, and that's uh, Board Policy 5112.3, uh, Student Leaves of Absence. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. And we need to note that uh, Trustee Irvin did not vote on this uh, item. All right, moving on to item number 50, board policy and AR 5113, absences and excuses. President Brown, in an effort to uh, save time today, I would like to pull VP at AR 5113. Um, it was pointed out by a trustee that this was on the August agenda and it was asked to be brought into a regularly scheduled board meeting. And I apologize, I did not do that, did not catch it, and put it back on today. So I would uh, recommend that we remove this, and I follow the board's will from August, and I bring that back at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Okay, so we will pull <laughs> item 50. Okay, do we have a motion to pull that item? Oh, so again. Uh, motion, motion by to Trustee Marks, uh, second. Oh. By Trustee mm -hmm. Mejia, those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. So that uh, motion has been pulled, and we'll note that uh, Trustee Irvin did not participate in that vote. Uh, moving on to item number 51, board policy and AR 5131.7. Weapons uh, and dangerous instruments. Yeah, this one I don't want to pull. BPNAR 5131.7. <laughs> uh, 
includes <laughs> includes information on weapons and uh, weapons and dangerous uh, instruments. Sorry about that. The BP is basically cleanup language recommended by California School Boards Association and is alignment with our district desire to provide the safest school possible. I do want to point out one. I, I would assume that one of the board members may have caught it, but maybe not. I, I, I want to recommend a change. Um, if you'll please uh, turn to page uh, 5137.7a. In the red paragraph, it states, unless a student has obtained prior written permission, as specified below, a student possessing or threatening others with any weapon, dangerous instrument, you'll notice that there is nothing below there that captures it. That's what I was going to ask. Oh, <laughs> more than one got it. I did not. So um, what I would propose is unless a student has obtained prior written permission from the site principal, a student possessing or threatening others uh, with any weapon, dangerous instrument, et cetera. Because what it's referring to is basically, let's say that we were doing a um, study on American Indians for, for, per se, and a parent and a student brought in a bow and an arrow. With permission from the principal, that would be allowed. Clearly, it would be supervised, and then the, the dangerous object would be taken off campus. But I would, that, having that flexibility, I think, would be beneficial. And that could also apply to a drama production where there's a Absolutely could. Use of, mm -hmm. uh, of weapons. Okay. Any? Okay. So do we need to clean up that language a little bit then to make that? So it, permission doesn't necessarily apply to everything in that uh, in that uh, sentence. Unless a student has obtained prior written permission from the site principal, a student possessing or threatening others with any weapon, dangerous instrument, or imitation firearm should be subject to a suspension and or expulsion in accordance with the law, board policy, and administrative regulations. So what it would mean is in order to possess something on a campus, you would have to have the site uh, principal's permission to do so. If but not, they couldn't obtain permission to threaten others no. with a weapon. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, there, there would be no. I think what they're saying is if the, if the if principal is given permission to bring, let's say, a bow and arrow, and they actually use that to threaten someone, they're going to be held accountable. They can't yeah. say, well, you gave me permission. So I think that's that's the point. Okay. Does that's that, a great example. I like that. Does that work for you, Adolfo, with your concern? <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that change, recommended change, uh, do we have a, 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 so we have a motion and a second to approve the first reading of board policy 5131.7. And uh, those in favor? Aye. And once again, uh, Trustee Irvin did not participate in that, uh, that vote. Um, now we're moving on to item 52, board policy AR 5142 safety. This is a new policy. Yeah, BP 5142 uh, and, I, and its corresponding AR includes information on general safety and the importance of providing a safe uh, school environment that is conducive to student learning. The BP includes information on security, digital awareness, supervision, student safety patrols, and student identification cards with the appropriate state law safety information. This BP is new and follows the recommendations of California School Boards Association. It's recommended that the district approve BP 5142. Any questions or comments on this uh, board policy? All right. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 5142 safety? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Daly. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, 
Uh, motion carries. And note that uh, Trustee Irvin was not here for this vote. Um, moving on to item 53. This is uh, board policy and AR 5148.2 before and after school programs. Yeah, I took this one last time too, and there's already changes. VP and administrative uh, regulation 5148.2 includes information on our before and after school programs. The pol policy primarily is clean up language based on updates to primarily expanded learning opportunities, the ELOP funds. So this includes ELOP, it includes existing ACEs and 21st century funds and the requirements as such. It's recommended that the board approve the updates, uh, approve uh, the updated board policy 5148.2. All right, any questions regarding that? Uh, do we have a motion to approve the first reading of board policy 5148.2 before and after school programs? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And so if ELOP uh, funding changes, we'll have to bring this policy back. Yeah, potentially. I mean, they're talking about making adjustments to ELOP, but I don't think that they're going to eliminate that funding, at least not what we're hearing thus far. Knock on wood, and let's hope it uh, continues because it's very helpful for our students. Uh, uh, number 54, board policy and AR 61. 14.2, bomb threats. Yeah, follow me on this one. So BP and AR 3516.2 is meant to replace our existing BP and AR for 6114.2. So it's currently in 6114.2. I'd like to put it in, a, in BP 35162. And it includes information on bomb threats. So again, it's to replace the numerical organization that falls in line with California School Boards Association. We had it placed in a different section that California School Boards Association does not. So I want to point that out. I'm recommending that we keep the board policy language because the board policy language still applies. Uh, CSBA does not have that same language. They actually don't have a BP, but I, I, the language I think is fine and appropriate. Um, it is recommended that the board, again, delete BP 6114.2 on bomb threats and approve the revised BP 3516.2 on bomb threats and the corresponding AR. Okay, any questions? So we have specific, I didn't see what ha what happens with the, the person, the uh, discipline that happens with a student who makes this same threat. Um, do we, because we did that with the students who brought a weapon to school um, and or threatened someone. Then on this one, do we have the same shall be suspended or expelled? I don't know if it's in that language. I would tell you, I know that the conduct code has a consequence for it, but I'm looking and scanning. Give That's me a fine. Because, yeah, because I, yeah, the conduct code yeah, the conduct covers, code, actually, it covers the weapons, uh -huh, everything. Correct. Okay, that's fine. I just know we had, when we had this happen in a bathroom just down the street, we had a student who was trying to get out of a test, and he actually made a fake bomb, but put it in the boys' restroom. And another student, we did not realize this, but we accused this other student who had done similar things of that threat. And it turned out that he had nothing to do with it. And the other one who actually did it came forward and said, don't get him in trouble. I'm the one who made the threat. So I appreciate the fact that the student was honest, wrote a <laughs> apology because the SWAT team had to come to our school. And it was very expensive for that family to pay this because they, they, they had to pay the bill. The family had to pay the bill for the SWAT team, which was $12,000 at that time. So... But that was the consequences of his uh, just trying to get out of a test. So anyway, I appreciated the fact that he took responsibility and came forward and didn't allow the other student to take that hit for something he did. But I, that's what I was looking at. Pardon? His whole family did. It was, it was tough. I ended up, I happened to know the family and learned a lot about that after that incident. So it was quite the deal. <laughs> I do have a question on this. Uh, in the AR... On uh, page 3516.2, mm -hmm. 
letter B in the first red paragraph. Uh, it talks about uh, keeping the person on the phone yeah. to gather as much information as possible. I think we need to add in there uh, identifying the caller as another reason to keep that uh, sure. conversation going. They do at the bottom, you know, There's receiving threats. So on B, it says any staff member receiving a bomb threat by telephone call shall try to keep the caller on the line for as long as possible in order to gather information about the location, timing of the bomb, persons responsible. To the extent possible, the staff member should also take note of the caller's gender, age, any distinctive features of voice or speech, and any background noises such as music, traffic, machinery, or voices. The staff member should not hang up, even if the caller does, and copy the number and or letters on the telephone's display if available. Is that, is okay, that okay? Okay, that, that takes okay. care of that. But I'm, I'm just curious if we have any protocol where we can tap into a call with uh, uh, the police department so that they can get involved in tracking the caller. We usually, when the, in, in the instance where there is a bomb threat, we work with MPD, give them the information, and then they would try to also use whatever means necessary to try to identify the location of where that was met. It is not always, in my experience, something that they can track per se, but there are those attempts that's done by the police department. And phone is just one, one form of communication. It could be social media, it could be letters, it could be, you know, multiple ways, and also... Um, through their student information um, program. So there's lots of different ways of, of making that. Okay. All right. So I, I'm grateful yeah. that you saw something that I overlooked. Uh, any other questions or comments about this? Um, so this is uh, board policy 6114.2. Do we have a motion to approve that uh, first reading of that policy. Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Is it 35? Yeah, it's 35.16. The deletion of 6114.2 and the uh, ex uh, acceptance of the first reading of BP 35.16.2. Do we need to formally delete that one and uh, or is this just a substitution? It is delete. It's currently in six one one four point two. I would propose deleting it out of six one one four point two, both the BP and AR, and move it into the one that aligns with Gamut, which is our California School Boards Association, which is thirty five sixteen point two. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that we take this in two steps. Let's first uh, go with a deletion of sixty one fourteen point two. Uh, board policy 61.14.2, uh, motion for deletion, Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Lopez. Those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Okay, so now we've got the formal action to delete, and now let's uh, go with approval of the new code number uh, eight, uh is the board policy and the AR both going to be under 3516 or Correct. is it just the That's AR? What I'm recommending. Yes. Okay, so board policy uh, 3516.2 bomb threats. Do we have a motion for approval for the first reading of that? I <laughs> 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 a, a motion by Trustee Mejia and a loud second by Trustee Ir Irvin. Vice President Irvin. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we've taken two actions there. Now we move to item 55, uh, which is board policy and AR 6142 point, or 6164.2. Guidance and Counseling Services, Mr. Herbst. Yeah, BP 6164.2 includes information on the guidance and counseling services within Modesto City Schools. The BP updates our existing board policy and includes relative, relevant information that aligns with our current counseling and guidance program. I am recommending the deletion of the corresponding AR as the information is either way outdated or it's duplicative in terms of what's found in the BP. It's recommended that the board approve BP 6164.2 with a plan to delete the corresponding administrative regulation. 
Okay, any questions on uh, this board policy and the deletion of the AR? Trustee Daly, you're the uh, specialist on this area. <laughs> I am not a school counselor, just so that is clarified. Uh, <laughs> so, And I do not have any experience in that area. However, I do have a significant experience in the mental health component. And so I'm, I'm more curious, I think, in this particular section on the page D, when it comes to personal or mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. My question is more in association to when do we determine that it is appropriate or more appropriate to send the students and or parents to community agencies, organizations, or health cares? Because what is the scope of practice for a school counselor in compared to a mental health counselor? Not every, I know the, the contract with Center for Human Services is most of the time specific when it comes to clinicians, licensed individuals, or associate individuals. That's specific to certain students, but not all students. SASs are all students. Those are available to all students, but those are not master's level individuals. Correct. So when, when is it determined that they need outside help? Through a triage approach. So it's going to depend on the severity of the need, whether or not a school counselor or student assistant specialist would take on that role in terms of short term. I'd call it almost, pro, almost, I wouldn't call it academic counseling, but I'd almost call it more social emotional skill building and support. Mm -hmm. If by nature and severity of what's going on with that child, they could be served by either one of our mental health clinicians. It's not ours, we still contract out. But in terms of severity, or they could be uh, uh, recommended for outside counseling outside by another by a local uh, uh, organization or agency. Do we contract for anybody with um, outside agencies <clears throat> that are allowed to see all students or only students with Medi-Cal? Uh, no. Well, if, if it's done by our individuals, even with CHS, they do not have to be Medi-Cal eligible. Oh. Correct, nice. yes. Now, I, I, just to point out, though, because you do bring up a good point, there are a <laughs> number of um, school sites that, where we have an agreement with Stanislaus Behavioral and the Center for Human Services to where rather than have an individual child that is Medi-Cal eligible go to the center or to an office at Stanislaus Behavioral, they actually put their Medi-Cal only eligibility clinicians on our campus, but that's few and far between. We also employ other mental health clinicians that that same wall barrier is not there. Okay. So the other question I have is in reference to written parent guardian consent shall be obtained before mental health counseling or treatment services are provided to students, except when students is authorized to consent to services pursuant to family code, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the only time that they're authorized to provide services for themselves or consent to services for themselves is if it is deemed detrimental to their mental health. And so how are we determining that? Can you ask your question one more time, Trustee Daly? I, I heard the lead <laughs> and I understand it, but you're asking me how it's determined? Right, so the, the only way that they're a student, so somebody under age of 18, is allowed to consent to mental health services is without parental consent is if it is deemed detrimental to their mental health. So how is that being determined? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, it's probably best if I get back to you officially, I'm just going to do one brief hypothesis. I believe it may be in situations where the students are danger to themselves or others potentially. That's what I'm thinking there, but I would want to make sure of that. Oh. Well, well, go ahead. Um, Mr. Herbst, isn't there, um, doesn't students, I have the ability to ask for mental health services without their parent consent if they're over the age of 13? Uh, no. Oh, no, I don't so believe so. A, a, so a, a child over the age of 13 can check out of our schools for medical treatment, but they can't, they can't engage in mental health services on our campuses without a permission. Correct, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. 
So in looking at the written uh, that there, the position that Trustee Daly talked about was the threat to themselves or others. As I recall, what we've done in the past is taken a student away. Let's say a teacher sees something in a written assignment and says, this is a warning signal. They alert the staff at the school and say, we need to uh, talk to the student. But for my understanding, we've always also told the parent this, we've identified your student today as being in a very, you know, difficult situation. We want you to know that we're taking them into counseling. And so that the parent is always um, informed. Yeah, of you're that. referring to a risk assessment, correct? Yes. Okay. Just checking to make sure we're still doing it that way and that that's um, how, it, how it works. So that's helpful. So thank you. Just to clarify, the minor's consent to care is typically limited to mental health treatment and counseling in an outpatient setting only. So you can't inpatient them without parental consent. And then there, there is also, and it is 12 years old and older in reference to that. But it has to, um, where is it at? detrimental to the child's mental and physical health if the parents knew. I want to see if they're making a hold on medical. Checking back on the one that we pulled, I want to see if the connection that uh, Dr. Noguchi made was accurate. Yeah, I, I'm I'm comfortable just because what, what the the point that Trustee Daly is making is made is based on family code and health and safety code. Actually, what's made me second guess more than anything else is I, uh, as 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 we pointed out when we pulled the other board policy on absences and excuse or excuses and absences, I believe is the title. Um, to Sarah's point. A student may leave campus for a confidential medical appointment. I would want to check to see if that medical appointment may indeed be mental health. So I'm looking to see if that section of code or the section of law that's cited on that is actually that one. Mr. Herbst, would this also apply to our SASs where they can be seen a certain number of times? But over that, they have to have? They still would have to have parent permission. Different, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. It, it's still different. So why don't we pull this one so we can do a little bit more research and bring it back on our next lovely Saturday extravaganza. Okay. That is gray water that we need to make sure that we uh, navigate safely. Um, so we are dealing with board policy AR6164 guidance and counseling services. We're recommending that that be pulled for future. Yeah. Let's just take a... Yeah, I think we need to do a little bit more research on that because the question comes down to what Trustee Daly said, can a child leave for mental health services without parent consent? In some parts of the law, it says that you can, but what is that? So we'll, we just need to get, we just need to get to clarification. Um, or, or not, right? I, we don't know. So um, let's, uh, can we vote on tabling this and then we'll yes, bring it back? So we'll, we'll vote on tabling board policy in AR 6164.2. Uh, it's been recommended that we pull this one. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. So uh, we are in full agreement. So that one's been pulled. And I would imagine that we will bring both of these back together because I think that there's some central themes to 51... 13 and 6164, so we'll, we'll bring those back together. Okay, great. So in a public session on a yep. regular night. Okay. In 
In a public session or yes. at our next? In a public session. Yeah. Okay. In all transparency, um, we may want to pull the safety one. Where'd that go? Because it states the parameters in which a student can leave. It's campus. the law, though. So there's there's law. So this th these will clean that piece up. It'll make it clear on what the law says relative to a 12 year old leaving, because that ultimately is the controversy having a 12 year old leave without parent consent, and which is law. But we can have that discussion on how that applies, and if there's some sort of um, it's a discussion we need to have. Would it be, wouldn't you want to put it though, if that's the case, if it's the law, you'd want to have it in the safety section too, is the, what I'm saying, because it's not in the safety section. So if it's determined that the 12 year old can leave campus, the only stipulation is emergency services in the safety section without leaving. So we can come, let, let's do yeah. these two and then we can come back and bring that in. I mean, um, so let's see how this conversation goes with the decisions, okay? All right. <clears throat> Only because we just passed safety. Okay. We are going to move on then to item number 56, and this is an AR 6164.4, Identification and Evaluation of Individuals for SPED. Yeah, I included the BP just for a reference. There are no changes, so this is strictly just the AR. Again, primarily cleanup, but very, very important as there's a number of reviews that take place to where our administrative regulations need to be accurate. Um, so new information is the transition from Part C to Part B of the IDEA, and there's a section in on that as well as a couple other little cleanup areas. Um, so uh, any questions or concerns with the revisions to AR 6164.4? All right, so any questions uh, from any board members on the AR? Seeing none, we do not take action on a, an AR, so we've at least addressed it by the board and uh, move it forward for a second reading. Uh, second read on the AR? No, no. Not a second reading. No oh, second reading on the ARs. Okay, got it. So that is item 56. 57 is board policy and AR 6173, education for the homeless. AP and AR 6173 includes information on the education of students who are homeless. I believe this board policy was taken to you this last year and is already in need of update based on recent changes. Um, and it cites uh, various uh, education code and different requirements as it uh, pertains to McKinney-Vento Act. It's recommended that the board approve the recommended changes to BP 6173. Right. Any questions on 6173? Just on behalf of uh, Trustee Maestas, he wanted you all to engage in a conversation on changing the word from homeless to unhoused as it is starting to become in mainstream that it's unhoused as opposed to homeless. But how do we change that language not only in our policy but in all of our use of the word homeless the, the, in the district? I, I have a recommendation. I had spoke at length with uh, Senior Director Daniel Hinkle who oversees the, the, the education of these students in this situation. And what she had recommended is that Honestly, there's very, very few children that are truly homeless or unhoused. What the, the verbiage that they use when they interact with the family are, the, are um, families that are in a transitional living situation. So if, if, if we are going to make a move, I would recommend that we use transitional living situation because that can be somebody who is truly homeless in transition, somebody that is with a, uh, um, living with an aunt, family member, et cetera, housed, et cetera. I think that that would be a good terminology to use personally. Uh, that might clarify also stu students that are now staying with like uncles and uh -huh. aunts that are actually, you know. Which still qualify under McKinney-Vento but are not unhoused nor are they homeless. Yeah, so it really correct. encompasses, uh, it's a nice broad it's more term and more that encompasses. more common correct. that you have relatives taking correct. care of others but they're still in, they're still in yeah. transit. So there are, there are those students who are truly unhoused. 
Correct. There are, uh, I don't want to say a handful, I shouldn't, the, the overwhelming minority are students that are homeless or unhoused. The okay. majority are in situations to where they are living with other individuals, living in a shelter, et cetera. There's very, very few that are truly home, no, no shelter. That's so do we, do we feel like the language of uh, housing and transition addresses those that are truly without a home and uh, living on the streets? Well, you want to go with the majority. If our majority of them are in transit, but are in transit. I, I want to make sure that we're living. inclusive of everyone. Right. Yeah, but there's nothing that's going to be exclusive because a transitional living there. situation could be. I am I am in yeah. my car. I am truly Most homeless, but I'm hopefully transitioning away from shelter into this situation and in a transitional setting with the hope to get back into a home. Yeah, just recently dealt with a family that's in that situation. Um, I know that uh, when we had the tent city in town, we did have some households that had uh, students. We did. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily call them housing and transition because that was a permanent arrangement, no, not in a home. The, the terminology that I'd recommend would be transitional living situation. Can I jump in real quick? I think this goes back to trust, uh, Vice President Urban's comment earlier around um, free lunch program. This, the connotation that come with using the term homeless or unhoused can have a negative connotation where part of the conversation with Ms. Hinkle yesterday was the use of the term transitional living situation helps to remove that maybe the stigma or the negative connotation that comes with that. Even the intent of the tent city is still transitional. Yes, it's right. not transition. ultimately the it's goal to have them permanently placed right. in that type of setting. Right, because legally you can't do that. Right. You know, that's why it has to be transitional. Yeah, I have a question. Have been permanently out there. So because the students who are actually in a home that has a roof, running water, a toilet, a kitchen, they're in transitional living. But we had students that live at a park that the only running water is when the restroom at the park is open. So we had a, I sat in on a SARB one where we had that. We had five kids there living at a park and moving from park to park as they would close them. And so that student to me, so when I look at this, the resources that are available to a student who has no roof over their head is different to me than a student who does have a roof over the head. Are there resources available more in that, we'll call him a no roof over the head student than the one who is in transitional living? Because if we change the title, does that mean that now we broaden it? So we took our 15 students and now we said we have 100 students that are in, the, in a transitional living. So just wondering how the funding in, works. In no way, shape, or form. So the, uh, both of the they examples that you it. just used, they fall okay. under McKinney-Vento awesome. in terms of uh, support and all the supports that we get that we would still be able to provide regardless of the two examples that you gave. Okay. I just want to make sure that those students who had greater need were still provided for because their need, some of them as huge as has been alluded to already. Correct. All right. So I think that's valuable to make sure that we are including the needs of all of those within the category. <coughs> um, so any other questions or comments regarding uh, 61, what, let's see, where are we? 6173. We have a motion to add Approve the first reading of the board policy, 6173. And are we changing it? Changing the verbiage to transitional living situation? Transitional living arrangements? Or the, I know that Trustee Maestas had brought up the point of not using the term homeless per se. After consulting with Danielle and I agree, I actually believe transitional living situation would be the appropriate way to. So throughout the BP and AR, we would change references to homeless to a, into transitional living situations. So do we? Let's go with a thumbs up if we agree on that uh, verbiage change. Like we're in in uh, full agreement. So uh, with the change. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, approve 6173.1 for first reading? I'll second. 
Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Marks, and uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that included the title, correct? So the title would also be changed from homeless to transitional living situation. If you would like the title, yeah. They, they will come yes. to you and do an FPM reviews and look for our... Okay, we'll vote on that too. I didn't know if it would be confusing just as we're changing over or if we did homeless slash transitional living situations so that it was clear what we were meaning. Self, and it may not be for the right reason. Selfishly, I still like the term because that is what is referenced when they come to do FPM reviews. So right. having that term, and I understand the reason why we don't want to use it, but having that term for consistency in terms of FPM would be helpful. Okay. Um, so I, I, I would recommend to you doing something like, oh, goodness gracious. Education for um, homeless, uh, home or education for students in transitional living situations slash homeless, something of that okay. nature would work. Okay, is that okay? Then I make a motion to approve that verbiage for the title. Uh, motion by Trustee Marks to change the title, as uh, recommended by uh, Mr. Herbst, and. Uh, Trustee Marks made the motion. Trustee Daly seconded. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And number 58. Last but certainly not least for me. AR yep. 6173, <laughs> Education for Foster Youth. And the board policy, once again, is in there for a reference. No recommended changes to the, to the BP. AR 6173.1 includes administrative regulations on the education of foster youth. The AR is basically cleanup language uh, from the AR previously used. Do you see any questions or concerns with AR 6173.1? Any questions regarding AR 6173.1? I have questions if there's communication. I didn't see anything in regards to not discriminating against foster youth. I believe it would be in an additional, it's in a different board policy that talks about our anti-discrimination, probably, I would guess, in the use of uniform complaint procedure would be so, my assumption. Mm -hmm. Can you just do a... A, a reference? No, 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 the weekly check-in thing, I forgot the name. Mm -hmm. Board, board, board communication board policy on discrimination. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is an AR only, so we will not uh, take a vote on this. Mm -hmm. We're just... Uh, reviewing it. Um, we move on to Dr. Noguchi's section. We've made it, folks. Yeah. We're almost there. We're in the final stretch. Almost there. But that I, doesn't minimize the importance of what we're going to it, do. No, mm -hmm. actually. It's, <laughs> now, board bylaws, we're reminded that board bylaws are different than board policies. They really are what governs the governance team. So it's the work that we all do together and, and how you all work individually and collectively and how we work together as the team. So the first one is Board Bylaw um, 9220, Government Elections. Um, this is new to our, um, our MCS bylaw catalog. Um, this came about um, in December of 2022, uh, um, just this last December, with the passing of AB 2584 and Senate Bill um, 1061, which really reflects on the revisions um, in the election process and procedures. Prior to that, we only had a resolution that outlined it. Here, we now actually have um, a board bylaw on. Um, so at this point, do you, are there any questions on board bylaw um, 9220? I have a question. Um, if you go down to the, what is it? So first page, um, second paragraph where it says district employee elected to the board shall resign from their employment before sworn in or um, shall have employment automatically term terminated um, before being sworn into office. What about the reverse of that? So say you got like John, you know, he wanted, wanted to go into teaching. His situation would be the reverse. 
she was going to apply for a job with this with the district. Um, if he applied for the job in the district, he'd have to resign. Okay, but that's the reverse of a, of a district employee. This one says district employee, but it doesn't address a board member, even though they're talking about being on the board. You see what I'm saying? Well, I, I believe there is a bylaw that, that references a board member can't be an employee of the district. So I think that that is in a different bylaw. And, and Cindy knows the bylaws, and probably um, President Brown knows the bylaws better than I do, but I believe that that's already referenced, just not in this one. We could add it if you, if you want. It's I believe it's in the Ed Code that says that, because I rem and there's also a stipulation that if a board member's spouse um, is cannot move up in the district. They can't, like, let's say they're a teacher and they want to be an administrator. As long as that board member is on the board, they cannot move into any higher position. And if we hired them, it has to be disclosed that board member has to be on the board a year before they could hire someone that is their spouse into the district, and then that has to be disclosed. So it's so that the public is aware. So there couldn't be any, you know, oh, I got elected, now I can get you hired kind of thing. So that's what they were preventing, I guess, in that egg code. But it's been in there for a long time. So I believe yours is correct that you could not. You'd have to resign. And you cannot hold two elected positions at the same time. We had that happen in our city where there was a school board member in another district who also won the election for the city council. And then he, it took some pressure, but he had to resign from his school district uh, employ as a school board member. Uh, he was trying to take what he could from both to, you know, he just, he was, like, hey, I got elected both positions, can I stay? But then it was determined that by state law, by the attorney general, you cannot do that. So he had to resign from whichever one he chose to, which he chose to resign from the school district. So that can happen too. But it's a good point. I think it's a good point that you brought up. You know, it has to, it has to go both ways. So Vice President uh, uh, Irvin, do you want me to add in, um, and I'll find the language for it because I know it is embedded somewhere else, but that is uh, that is a, a district employee um, Right, just for clarity, you know, just so you have both ends of the, the spectrum there from a board, from a employee standpoint. Um, so a district then, employee elected to the board shall resign right. from their um, from their employment. So um, a district and a board member. So board member shall resign if they accept employment, accept employment with the district. Or could they even even? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Roman for the language for it, but um, accept um, a position within the district. All right, any additional questions? And then this one on uh, uh, page A down there um, where it says campaign conduct. Um, I didn't even know this existed. A board member shall not expand and a candidate shall not accept any public money for the purpose of a seeking elective office. However, the district may establish a dedicated fund for those seeking a lesson to the board <laughs> provided that the funds are available to all candidates who are qualified pursuant to the education code. I didn't even know that existed. That's government code. That's <laughs> not <anyway. laughs> the fund. <laughs> yeah. So that's good to know for the future. <laughs> Could get very expensive because uh, <laughs> that could be the draw for candidates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's the district putting money in for elections. I think it's a it's a fund for those for others to put into, but it but that those funds are then open to whomever whoever runs either on current the board current or not. All right, additional questions. All right, do All right. we uh, do first and second reading for by bylaws? Uh, for board bylaws, yes, with the exception of two that I'm going to ask for approval today, for, and I'll explain why, but yes, this one will come back. Okay, so let's, uh, do we have a motion to... Mm -hmm. Approve uh, first reading of 9220, the board bylaw. Okay. Uh, Vice President Irvin? 
Made the motion, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. And number 60 is uh, Board Bylaw 9293, Filling Vacancies. Filling Vacancies. So this one is also new to our MCS bylaw catalog. This really came out at, from mandates from this past December with Senate Bill 1061. Um, which updated um, the provisional appointments. This um, bylaw also reflects um, a new attorney general's opinion on how a vacancy is to be filled when a district's trustee areas have been revised or election methods have changed from at-large um, to trustee area. Um, I do have one comment from Maestas, and that is um, on page one, number five. Um, it says a board members ceasing to be a resident of the district. So here it says um, a vacancy on the governing board may arise from any of the following events. Um, a board member ceases to be a resident of the district, but he asked the question, should it also be um, the board member ceases to be a resident in the identified trustee area? What I shared is I believed it was number six, um, but he still wanted me to share that. Basically, he asks, is it redundant? Two different things. Two different things. Yeah. Moving, that's like the difference between an intra-district and an inter-district But all within the district. Yeah. Okay. Additional questions? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Do we have a motion to approve the uh, first reading of this board bylaw? Motion by Trustee Mejia, yes. second by uh, Vice President Irvin. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, new, moving to 61, board bylaw 9240, board training. So this one I am going to ask approval for um, rather than coming back as a, a second reading, partly because we actually began this conversation probably three or four months ago when I came to you and asked about professional development. Should we, um, should we approve one conference, two conference, CSBA plus one conference? And so we, we've already engaged in the dialogue. And so um, I'm going to bring forward um, a recommendation and, and, and get your feedback and input. We recognize that this is already within our board, pol our, our board bylaws. We're just looking to make some changes. Um, I'm really looking to add opportunities for board members to build their capacity as board members, right? It's been part of one of the hallmarks of my superintendency has really been the notion of building everyone's capacities from the teachers to the parents to, um, to you, which is the board members. So what I have added um, in here in, in Board Bylaw 9240 um, is the provisions that we continue with um, CSBA because I do believe not only is that a powerful um, conference individually, but I think it's a powerful conference for us collectively as a team and as a governance team because there we have the opportunity to um, experience that together. But I'm also recommending that we have one other additional um, conference. I know um, uh, Vice President Irvin is interested in, in going to a conference this July, and that's part of the reason why I'm asking for approval now rather than waiting further down because we need to get registrations if we choose to do that. So with that, I'll open it up to um, any additional comments. I think that what's reflected is it just shows why, why we're doing it and what we're aligning it to, ensuring that we're aligning it to our strategic goals ensuring that we're bringing it back to the board, what, what was learned as it relates to the work that we are collectively doing together, um, and that we would um, work to fund um, two conferences. Any questions uh, from the board? I do have one question. Uh, CSBA sponsors additional trainings, uh, such as the Masters in Governance uh, program. Would that be considered an additional conference, or do we need to uh, specify that as an option? 
I, I apologize and thank you for that. Um, I know you had mentioned that earlier and I actually did revise that to say participate in annual CSBA conferences, um, Masters of Governance and one additional conference. Um, we, um, SCO is working to get Masters of Governance here um, at SCO, so it's not gonna be a travel and there won't be a, that expense. We certainly would cover that expense because the Masters in Governance, as we all know, um, is a powerful uh, tool chest for any board member that does that. So. Um, I would recommend, although it's not here, I would recommend after CSBA conference, we add Masters of Governance, comma, and one additional conference. That's Masters in, in Governance. In Governance. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. If I have... Uh, completed the Masters in Governance and it's extremely helpful very good for just the overall view of the responsibilities of board members. So uh, with that change, do we have a motion to uh, approve this uh, bylaw and bypass the second reading? I just have one question on the one additional conference about the cost, if it's a, let's say the conference is in Washington, D.C., is that okay or not? Because NSBA does a conference in, in, a, in Washington, D.C. So I'm just asking, are there any parameters around the conference? Um, and would it be subject to approval, the additional conference? Because let's just say, you know something about the budget that we weren't aware of, we booked a trip to a conference and it's suddenly, you know, it's gonna be difficult but we'll have to, you know, so I'm just asking, should we put parameters around it or not? And I'm just asking that. I don't you know, know what I we have for our teachers yeah, or our I think staff. Yeah, I think it's a good question. What we could do as far as the protocol and getting approval for that, um, for that second conference is to bring to the board to have a discussion at the, at the end of one of our agendas as you, we're doing our reports and you're interested in going to this and this is why and this is, the, the, this is how much is budgeted. So... We're not going down to Costa Rica or, um, right. you know, out to Hawaii <laughs> or what have you. So I, I think that that could be a good provision to, conferences this year. to, to <laughs> safeguard. Okay. Because where, where one board member goes, it can be scrutinized for others too. So I think that we could add in there um, a sentence in um, uh, getting board approval. Yeah. Subject to board approval. Yeah, I think that's good. All right, so uh, with these changes, do we have a motion to uh, approve this board bylaw and bypass the need for a second reading? Motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Irvin. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect, thank you for that as we work towards um, planning for the summer. And the next one is uh, number 62, board bylaw and exhibit 9250, remuneration, reimbursement, and other benefits. So in this um, bylaw 9250, we are uh, um, asking for approval um, of this particular bylaw. It was also timely in this next board meeting, we'd like to come back with a resolution. Um, and the timing, it really um, is contingent upon HR and the processes they need relative to medical benefits, if, I, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, but it is is timely, and so we need to get it approved before, um, I believe, before June. All right, so with that, um, reimbursement and other benefits. Um, we've had different conversations um, about this um, over the course of a, a couple years, so um, hopefully this aligns with some of the conversations that we have had. Um, board bylaw 9250 um, really works to um, increase board compensation, but only in times of fiscal stability. Um, not anything more than what is allowed in education code. There has been questions posed to me um, over the course of my tenure here. How is it that board members in other districts are paid significantly more than the board members here? I, I don't know. The, the, we, the board, the ed code defines um, 
compensation for board members by the size of the district. So it was a it, it was set. Um, the other one was um, yeah. I'll bring that up in just a minute. So so with that, we did find or I did um, identify that board members are allowed to have uh, cost of living adjustments, if you will. Um, it is outlined in Ed Code up to five percent again um, on the parameters of fiscal stability. So um, that way a newer board member um, may not be getting paid the same rate that someone else had been paid, but it's a matter of the, the tenure in the seat, if you will. And so that's reflected. I did add that in um, on um, first page, the very first pa uh, paragraph. It says on an annual basis, and I want to add when when the district is fiscally stable, comma, the board may increase compensation for board members beyond the limit um, beyond the limit de um, delineated by education code in an amount not to exceed five percent. So what they're saying here is there's is amount delineated in Ed Code for an amount, but this gives this gives yearly um, uh, increases, if you will. The other part to um, this bylaw, it also just speaks about waiving the second reading, which we just did in the, the, the last board meeting. The other piece in this bylaw is outlining the, um, the, the health and welfare, is that board members do have the opportunity to um, have health and welfare and also life insurance um, through the board or through the district, so long as it is comparable to what other employees are getting, getting and that it is stopped at the end of their tenure. So for instance, you have life insurance, you can have life insurance, but uh, it is, um, it, I guess, sunsets at the time that you, you no longer are a board member. It's not something that continues on, and that is added into the section of um, health and welfare. A piece to note on this, um, and this aligns to other employees um, it, within the district, is that if the board member is um, getting, um, oh, it's not reimbursed. What's the word for it? Cash in lieu, thank you. Cash in lieu for um, the medical benefits. We we need um, evidence of the medical benefits, just like we do with all employees. So we're just aligning it to our practices with our employees. So those, I believe, are the those are the changes. Questions? So, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just trying to understand if there was a change in. My understanding was it the board members have been able to receive cash in lieu as long as they showed their uh, other person, uh, partner, whatever, their employment health insurance. Is that still in place or no? Where it's Because I haven't received any calls from anyone to say, can you please bring that in again? And so... Yeah, there was a district attorney uh, decision, or attorney general rather, decision related to cash in lieu and said board members specifically cannot receive cash in lieu of health benefits, right. but they are allowed to be reimbursed That's what we did. Okay. if they provide appropriate documentation showing the cost that they are okay. paying for an approved group health care coverage. Okay, that makes sense. So my question has to do with the same issue. Is Medicare... In, included in that list of uh, expenses that are incurred by a board member that can be reimbursed. We have to look that up. Yeah, let's check that so out. So Medicare is variable based on the selection of the supplemental coverage. And it is uh, a cost that the board it's member does. It's a cost is, that the board member does incur. I, I think it would be reimbursable, but I'll, we can uh, confirm that. Confirm. And a clarification on the life insurance. Um, we checked with VOIA, and you, you must work at least 20 hours to be eligible for uh, the district provision of the life insurance. However, that would fall under the category of the reimbursable uh, expenses if, if there's a, a life insurance plan board members participate in and provide evidence of the cost up to what the district contributes toward our certificate of management employee. But that's very difficult to document the 20 hours equivalency. Uh, so it only available to, to uh, uh, district employees who uh, work uh, a minimum of 20 hours or more. My understanding is 
you wouldn't be eligible as a board member for uh, the life insurance plans through VOYAS directly, but the cost could be reimbursable if you have a life insurance plan up to that amount, if that makes sense. I think we need longer board meetings. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and we don't need them every week. Yeah, well, we need <laughs> Trustee Gailey, you had a question. So I have one, what's the documentation for the life insurance? Um, <laughs> and two, I, I have concern with, with this because there are certain jobs that their compensation is part of their premium, so they don't, it doesn't appear that the premium is being paid. However, that is a portion of the compensation. So... The, so you're talking about employer so provided an employee, policies. an employer provides the policy because it's part of the compensation for, so rather than making $28 an hour, they only make like $24 an hour because the employer pays the premiums. Yeah, so how do you provide evidence that it's a direct cost to you as a family uh, because it's on your spouses? Um, we, we, can, we can get with... Um, more of the folks with the expertise and see if there's a way to document a a cost that would be reimbursable in your specific situation. Well, it's not just mine because it's or or in, I'm Teamsters sorry that, that specific does that, situation. So. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. So it's going to be a lot of people. I stand yeah. corrected. Thank you. Okay. Any other Additional questions? Additional questions. So I I support the uh, option for the increase. Uh, primarily because it makes this position more attractive to those who uh, are contemplating running for the to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, there are situations where it's needed to be able to provide the service. Okay, so um, do we have a motion to approve uh, board bylaw 9250 without a second reading? A question for you there. Um, so when would that take place? Like you said, the the, co the COLA in terms of the increase? In you know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I'd have to um, talk to Roman about about what that what that looks like in the timeline. It would be each year at the same time. I would think probably beginning of the year, like everybody else. Um, the only thing I would add, um, Trustee Brown, is I do want to add when when district is fiscally stable yes. into that, and yes. to just make sure that that is added. Okay. So we'll. Uh, did that answer your question, yes, John? Yes, that answered my question. So we we need to make sure that this is not um, retroactive, but uh, in a future okay. period. Do we want to state that? Or is that understood? No, Nothing in it that says that it would be retroactive. I would assume no one would <laughs> believe that unless you said it is retroactive. Because it's lined it out even. Right, it wouldn't come effective until okay. after we vote on it. This is a, a yeah, huge modification okay. thing to what we ever did. All right, so. So July 1. Or July 1, yeah. So just so you're also aware, when we had to make huge cuts in the district and we could not give our employees a raise at the time, we also as a board voted to cut our uh, monthly stipend. stipend because we felt that it was important to also understand the difficulties that our staff was going through. So we did that, and then a few years later we, we reinstated it. So... Um, but I felt that it was a wise thing to, to do at the time. Yeah. I think we would probably want to reserve the option and just do it as a separate action. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't know which, you know, we but may no. be completely fiscally stable for the next eight years and only half the board that we have here. We don't want to make the decision for a board 
in the future. Um, but we all know, for those of us that have lived through massive cuts, everything gets cut. And boards, you know, look at that as another option as well. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, let's. We've talked about this, and I think we are ready to move forward with that motion with the change when fiscally fe uh, when fiscal stability or when fiscally stable. Yes. And I think that was the only major change. So motion to, and this is understanding that we're moving to approve without a second reading. Right. Yes. So motion by Trustee Mejia, second by Trustee Marks. So I just have a on the E, the resolution on board compensation for missed meetings. Just ensuring um, right now, I'm just wondering if this changes what we're already doing. Just on the bottom there. What, where I, are you at? Uh, e, the, the page E9250, There's is just the front, that one page. At the bottom it has, uh, at the one, two, three, go, after the fourth whereas, there's those three bullets, we'll call them parentheses, and they say why to give, whereas the board finds that this person did not attend this meeting on this date for the following reasons, and then it says which reasons they are. Uh, performance of, or other designated duties for the district during a time of the meeting. They had an Ill illness or jury duty. There was hardship deemed acceptable by the board. So does that mean, I just am wondering how that would be different, or is it the same as how we've been doing it? So if a person has a vacation planned and they're not in, we'll say they can't attend because the internet service is unavailable. So is that a hardship deemed acceptable by the board? So then we'd say, okay, we will reimburse you for that meeting or not. We used to say you got, if we had two meetings in a month, it would be $325 or whatever it was at that time per meeting. So if you missed one of them and it didn't meet the criteria, then you didn't get the $350 for the other meeting. For that meeting that you missed. So, so is, your, is your question lack of internet, lack of unplanned internet, and an um, an available hardship? I think for each one, I mean, it, all sorts yeah. of different things can. I think that's why we have hardship deemed acceptable by the board. Right. I think it just covers. I, it, I'm, it I'm covers, lost. Yeah. Where are yeah, we talking about? Right the uh, E. I'm, so as you go through this, as what we just voted on, or we're going to vote on, re, right after the re, well, remuneration. I can tell you I didn't have this paper either, but Mr. Henderson had it. Oh, you don't have I don't it. I don't even know what you're talking about. Because okay. you don't have it in your, you don't, I, ah. sorry for that. I didn't have it either, but I just got it from Mr. Henderson. So it's right up there. So this okay. is, this talks about if you miss a board meeting. So um, Cindy is out because she's decided to okay. go to Tahoe. Yeah. Um, right. But she's not going to, she's also not going to engage in the board meeting because she needs, this, it's her vacation time. That would not be deemed acceptable to get compensation. However, if she's she's off to Hawaii and she plans to do um, do the board meeting, the internet, she shows up closed session but not open session because internet goes down. Each of those, we talk to the board president as far as what's deemed as a hardship or not. Because if it's a hardship, then you still are compensated for for your meeting. And we do that with each every time you guys are absent, um, we ask what that um, what the um, you know, the reasons for that, if it was something to do with, you know, I'm on vacation and I'm, I just need to tune out, that's different than being, you know, at a CSBA delegate right. assembly meeting where you couldn't be in this board meeting because you were somewhere else. And so um, this just formalizes it because um, it's it's a way of tracking it. Okay. okay. That's fine. I just wanted to understand if it was any different than what we were doing. And so that helps. Thank yeah, you. And so I apologize much. for not having E. I, I, I was... In a motion and a second, so I apologize. Okay, motion and a second. <laughs> Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Number 63. All right. This is Board Bylaw 9320. It has to do with meetings and notices. And you'll notice that this mandate came in December 2021. 
And if you recall, during that time, we were in thick of COVID. So really what this is going to speak to is some of the parameters that we found ourselves in in COVID. So um, this really clarifies discussions with board members via technology of the majority of the governing board regarding an item within the subject matter um, of the Brown Act. What this says is we really need to be able, we really need to provide uh, materials to the public, post an agenda, and have it available. So this was really this is really late to be honest with you. This was deep in COVID. Anytime we you had four board members together and we were talking about any one thing, even if it was on Teams, we needed to have an agenda and have it posted. I don't believe we violated anything. However, there's still other parameters within this bylaw um, around teleconferencing that I think. Times have changed, and board, the board bylaw needs to be updated to reflect that. This is going the way of electronic signatures. Yeah, exactly. And so there are very few changes on this. Um, teleconferencing during proclaimed state of emergencies, that was added to it. So hopefully we're not going to have another pandemic in my lifetime. <laughs> or at least while I'm superintendent. All right. All right. Are there any questions? Any questions on that one? Motion to approve the first reading of Board Bylaw 9320. My motion. Motion by Trustee Daly, second by Trustee Mejia. Those in favor, aye. Aye. And now we move on to 64, 9323, meeting conduct. All right, I want all of us to take a deep breath because I want your, really want your attention for this one because it, it affects us at each of our board meetings, and this is the last one. Okay, so um, as you know, in our board meetings, um, it's really important to be really clear when you speak, when the public speaks, when they have the opportunity to speak, because if, if they, we don't have real clear rules and guidelines, then fee people feel disenfranchised and they don't feel like we're being transparent. So I'm hoping that the paragraph that I wrote here is going to help in some of that uh, dialogue that we've been having this last couple months relative to community input. So um, in and board by law. A new document that we were given at the dais. Did you give them a new document? So yes, I rewrote it yesterday afternoon and I sent it to you. Okay, I'm just going to read it from here. Um, so in the board bylaw, number three is where I'm going to bring your attention to. Okay, so number three, and I'm going to read it out and see if this makes sense, but I also want you to visualize our world, okay? So without taking action, so this goes under, in order to conduct district business, district business in an orderly and effective manner, the board requires that public presentation to the board, board complies with the following procedures. There's procedure one, procedure two, and now I'm gonna talk about procedure three. Without taking action, board members or district staff may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed by the public about items not appearing on the agenda. Now we all know to not violate the Brown Act, we cannot respond to items not on the agenda. So when I first read this, I called Roman to say, wait a minute, help, help me understand this. And we rewrote this together. So without taking action, board members or district staff members may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed by the public about items not appearing on the agenda for the purpose of clarification. So it's what Roman had shared is you really don't want to go down any sort of conversation if it's not on the agenda, but you can always ask for clarification. Clarification of a, a, um, a word or a statement or a process. So that's, all, that's okay. The next piece, further, the board president may request the superintendent to direct staff to answer the questions or provide resources to the public for items not on the agenda or to answer questions about items on the agenda. Meaning, someone comes up to the dais, they're asking President Brown or uh, uh, Trustee Lopez about something that's not on the agenda. President Brown can say, asking 
President Brown or uh, uh, Trustee Lopez about something that's not on the agenda, President Brown can say, ask Let's. <laughs> yeah, if you're not listening, she's going to say it louder. <laughs> oh. Well, I really hope that this is being recorded because I think it's important to the to the public. Are we good? Okay, we're going to wait. <laughs> that was scary. That <laughs> was scary. I sounded like my sister. It's like, oh my gosh, my sister's talking. <laughs> <laughs> Folks can't tell us. <laughs> All right, we're back on. All right, thank you. So we're going to go back over this again, not from the beginning, but okay. Furthermore, the president may request the superintendent to direct staff to answer questions or provide resources to the public for an item not on the agenda or to answer questions about items on the agenda. Meaning, someone comes up to the dais and asks about, someone comes up to the dais <coughs> in response to a board presentation and asks for something that doesn't have anything to do with the board presentation or asks for something on the presentation specifically like, what about the data for blah, 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 blah. The president, who is the facilitator, can say, Dr. Noguchi, can you have staff answer the questions for that individual, or can you have staff provide the information they need for clarification? Because I think what is happening, and we're seeing it, is folks are getting frustrated because they're not getting the information they need, but we can't dialogue with them here unless we're clarifying. A great example was last board meeting when Ms. Martinez asked us, what is the cluster model? The presentation wasn't clear. What's the cluster model for GATE? We can answer what the cluster model is. But if the question was, when was the last time we changed our gate protocols, I can say, Mr. Rich, can you, can, can you speak with Ms. Martinez on the history behind our gate protocols? That way, the, the community member is, is getting the information they need without violating um, any sort of um, Brown Act violations. So go ahead. Um, so, so let's go do public comment first, and then we'll do public comment as it relates to a presentation. So general public comment, that 30 minutes that we have for anyone to say anything. It's not on the agenda, right? It's not on the agenda. We can't respond to it. And we know that every board is, is really well trained in that. But I'm sensing that the community is still frustrated that they're not getting answers. So when there's a question posed, then President Brown can direct me say, uh, Dr. Noguchi, can you provide information for blank? And I'm usually texting people anyway, and they, they, we will then work with that community member to get that information. Now let's say we're doing a presentation on, oh, go ahead. So w does it only fall on the pr uh, President Brown? And I ask, and I ask this just because I know sometimes if, I mean, President Brown has been doing a great job uh, but like if something were, if someone were to not, you know, mention it to you like, hey, let's get that to them or a president in the future is, doesn't want to, um, you know, uh, take notice of that request, does then, does, does then it just doesn't happen if the board president doesn't specifically ask for it? So I think that's a question that you all have and we could come back and look at that in our board protocols. We can still... And we can still identify that today and then add it into our protocols. The way our protocols have it now is uh, the president is the one that directs the superintendent rather than you directing me. I mean, I don't, I, I, think, I think that's a conversation that you all need to have. Yeah, one thing that I've seen happen in our meetings is that that happens anyway, where someone from staff addresses that question, but that doesn't send the message to the public and I'll let, let them know how we're handling it. Mm -hmm. If the board president asks the superintendent to direct staff to address that question, mm -hmm. then the public who is not at the meeting knows that we are addressing those concerns directly. But I think what, um, and tell me if I'm misunderstanding this, I think what Trustee Lopez is saying is, Someone asks, someone says something, 
and they're directing it at Lopez, and you don't don't pick up with what they're asking for, mm-hmm. and we go on to the next person. What I would encourage you to do is you put you know put it in the queue so he mess so he can see that you have something to say, and then maybe he you say President Lopez is there something you want to say, and then you can say you know Dr. Gucci can you direct can you direct staff to get blah 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 blah. I do think that right now because we are coming across a lot of fundamental changes to this district that we um, and we're all sensing it. We do need to be. Um, we do need to be re- we do need to respond differently than we have in the past because of all the pressure that's out there. And so I think this way it helps message that we hear you and that we get the information to them. Does that make sense? So if at our next meeting on the 17th you won't be here, Mejia is here. Um, if for some reason you're hearing something that perhaps the president isn't, and this could happen next year as well, then you know put your light on and, and we'll we'll make it work. But we do need to help our community feel as though we are hearing them and we can provide them the information that they're asking for. So not only those that are here, but those who are listening or watching the meeting see that that's the practice that we're using. Right. So. Now, the last piece to that, again, the, the paragraph was really jumbled up, and I, I changed it around a bit. The very I added a number four, and it says... Um, Additionally, board members may make a brief announcement or make a brief report on their activities, which what we, is what we do. But that was actually lined out on that first paragraph. I just we, Roman and I just cleaned it up. But I think the purpose of this it will help us better respond as we move forward. That was long, and I screamed at you. Um, <laughs> but it's a good one. It's it's one that's been needed. All right, any, any questions with that one? That one's first reads, and so we can still do a second read. Too. Okay, so this is not something we need to take actual action on today. We will come back with a second reading. We will come back for a second reading, and if you want, and if you think that it's something that would be helpful, we can, we can talk about this. If we want to pull it and actually have a discussion in a regular board meeting about this for the second reading, so, it's, so we're also messaging to the community about what we're trying to do. Um, I can do that too. It's just we we can we can think about that, or it can be in consent. It's it's entirely up to you. Do we want to give direction now on that? Uh, do we want this to come back in public? I think it would be helpful. I'm seeing heads nod, uh, thumbs up. Okay. So we'll come back for a second reading, but I'll still go over basically the same thing. You're reminded that, and we then we can approve it that, then, but I'll basically summarize some of the changes and why there's the, the changes, because I think if we're transparent and if we're transparent in what we're trying to do, and we, we're all feeling the difference in our boardroom this year, but we're also doing some big changes, so. Changes in the boardroom, but very controlled. Yes. We're not seeing the board meetings out of control. Not yet. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with how the president uh, responds to the public. If there's a angst and a, a frustration by the president and they yell out or say something to the public, it just can incite them. And we've watched that happen in this room a few times, not with this group, but with other times. <laughs> oh, you boy, remember. we've seen it. Yes. So wow. just being able to be calm helps a lot. So I always encourage whoever's the chair of the group to be able to get as much training as they can. So when I was president of CSBA, I asked my executive board to, for all of us to take the um, training on the um, Robert's Rules of Order. So we understood when something happened, how to respond to it. If it's going to be something that's putting our board in a very contentious place, we want to be able to calm it down quickly and be able to move to the next item. So if that's possible. Now, we've had to shut down board meetings in this room before. The police actually had to come. And so we've had to do that before. Um, and I was very grateful that they came. So it just it can get out of hand. And we don't want to see that happen. So I think we'll have a good year and next year and however many after that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, speaking. Oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. Bonus, you now have a communication expert on board. Oh, no. <laughs> so I just have a question. I don't know if it needs to be in the board policy or if it needs to be here about asking clarifying questions. 
to the so if if something that the public says is confusing we can't engage in that that goes back down to the brown act we can ask a, clarif a clarification on a word or like what happened at the last board meeting what does a cluster model mean but we can't engage in the in dialogue around it, it, if it's deeper than just clarification for a word then i have staff go speak with them okay yeah, and that's good. on a so for both just to clarify so for public comment when we're not allowed to speak back to the public other than the chair can say oh i understand you're from this school site i'm going to ask you know let's just say um associate superintendent mr herbst to because it's special ed let's just say it's special ed uh, to contact you and then they see you get up and walk out with the person to go get their contact information so that way the public knows that so i see that happening at many times but maybe just and then on an item where it's on the agenda this is where it gets really sticky because they can ask questions uh, but it's up to the board really it's up to the board or the chair to say yes we'll answer that or we'll have staff answer that but we don't have to answer it they're just they're only here to give comment it's a public comment time it's our board meeting to do business. Now, we're generous and gracious because we want them to understand what's going on, so we will sometimes answer that. But someone, and we've watched this happen before, where someone from the public decides they want to get in a dialogue and attack one of our, our uh, employees, and they start this dialogue back and forth of questioning and accusing the employee of something happening at the school site, and that should not happen. The chair is supposed to keep that from happening. So I think this protocol or this board bylaw is to prevent that from happening, to prevent that dialogue and that exchange at that moment. That can happen, just not in this room and not at that time. It can happen to be, oh, Mr. Zerley, could you please, um, the, whoever, Mr. Smith, could you please give Mr. Zerley your contact information and we'll, and we'll have staff contact you to answer some of your questions so that you're clear on this matter. And that way it just stops it right then and that helps. And it helps calm and diffuse that. Because <gasps> any of you have been here before, I think Mr. Godot and Mr. Brown, we've seen that interaction which is not helpful for our employees and it's not helpful for the tension in the room. So just to clarify, it helps reduce the tension. So is that, did I get that correct in that dialogue and that not doing that? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's, it's it's, it's nuanced, right? It's, yeah. it's just going to yeah. depend upon how, how uh, the questions that are being asked, but we can't right. engage in the dialogue back and forth because... Um, yes, it will yeah. never and, end. And if you do it at one meeting, then you need to do it at the next. So it's clarification, and if it's more than clarification about content of what was just presented, then we can say that someone will help you. Um, we'll go through that again with you. Yeah. And we, what, we know that... When you're on the spot as board president, those yeah. of us that have been, it's easy to become unnerved and get yeah. flustered, but this is a very easy protocol to follow uh, and really kind of sets the pattern so that we don't uh, go down an area that is uh, not protected under the Brown Act. Yeah. Hey, to go back to Trustee Marks, you're talking about the... Um, um, Robert's Rules of Order and the parliamentary procedures, is it possible to to have that training for the board? You know, Robert's Rules and parliamentary procedures are one, you know. We can we can do that in our in our next, because um, we do governance training. training. Yeah, I can put that as the next governance training. Yeah. It yes, it helps. Yes. I can do that. Uh, yeah, Ben. I know CSBA does a president training, and it really helps just to hear what others say and how to respond in certain situations and then what to do with the media and all of that. But it, it also helps to have a really good knowledge of Robert's Rules of Order. The president, we used to have it in our desk, and there were times when we had so many motions going on one time that I understood what a Gordian's knot was and was able to say, I'm calling Gordian's knot because I had Robert's Rules of Order. And that was where there were so many motions, nobody knew what was going on. It just stopped everything. Then it starts fresh. And so I was like, okay, at least I learned that. So it's there's different things that help make the meeting run smoothly. And that's all we want is to be able to make it move. So back to the agenda. I think we still need to adopt first uh, reading. The first reading or approve the first reading of item sixty-four board bylaw ninety-three. 
23 meeting conduct and uh, we would want to adopt it with the changes that we have in front of us yes for page BB 9323 B uh, do we have a motion motion by trustee marks second by trustee Mejia and this will come back in open session in the public not as a consent item and we'll have a discussion in public and I, and I think I will wait till not April 17th because uh, Trustee Lopez isn't going to be here so I'll wait till the next board meeting when we're all here together great so we're all on the same same page good deal now we also have uh, item 65 Modesto City Schools board protocols and norms do we need to review those today no, or so are they here for reference. So oh. hang, so hang on. Back in January 9th, I came to you and asked. For, I don't think we took a vote. Oh, those in favor. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me on track, everybody. <laughs> so, Dr. Noguchi. Yes. So this is our last one. Um, board uh, protocols and norms. Um, January 9th, Sally Frazier came and we went through these along with the presentation. Um, I should have brought these back months ago and I, I didn't. Um, actually, Antoinette reminded me that we needed to bring these forward for actually the, the second reading. And so um, I've just added um, into our protocols what was discussed at that meeting, um, made, a few, made a few changes from what was asked, from adding a few words to the first page to really highlighting uh, Ms. Chambers' work around visitations and going through her. Um, those were primarily the, um, the major changes in this, but um, at this time I'm asking for approval for our board protocols and norms because um, this is the second read. All right, any questions? Do we have a motion to uh, adopt and in the second reading Modesto City Schools Board Protocols and Norms. So moved. Moved by Vice President Irvin, second by Trustee Daly. Those in favor, this is a vote. Aye. Aye. Now, we have a motion to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> I think I heard a second from Brandy over there. <laughs> Who was the second? Aye. 